welcome to Kurt Monogai's, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Monogat because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Michael Swaim. Good to be here, Alex. <laughs> oh, Lord. Good start. Here Def- I think go. it's appropriate for this book. I can defend that burp. <laughs> also, I'm drinking a lemon LaCroix. That's my defense, but... <laughs> This book is the blood meridian of the Kurt Vonnegut universe. You, I realize I, you haven't even said the title yet. <laughs> but this I, week is I like... I also have not read any Cormac McCarthy. Fine. But it's the most <laughs> human, disgusting, slimy... And that's yeah. saying a lot for a Kurt book, I thought. My overwhelming impression of the book was, Jesus, God, like humans are gross. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get into it. The book is called yeah. Hocus Pocus. It's Hocus published Pocus. in 1990. When you say it's like Blood Meridian, I feel like some people will hear that as it's one of the greatest works of one of the greatest authors. Mm. You know? I guess I just mean that Cormac McCarthy, who's already known for not pulling punches and being grim, Blood Meridian is famously like, well, boy, howdy, this is grim, <laughs> even for you. <laughs> and for Kurt Vonnegut, who's like known for being wry in the face of life being a crock of doo-doo, as the protagonist in this book would say. Yeah. This is the most pungent crock of doo-doo he has ever crafted, I think. <laughs> like the whole yeah. thing teams of like sleaze and greasiness and not in the way where Breakfast of Champions was depressing, like empty and sterile. There's a lot going on that's very human, but it definitely, one of the through lines is the book of the book is comparing humans to germs. And I yep. think it pulls that off pretty well. All the humans seem like germs. Yeah, it really <laughs> does. They really do. Well, let's, let's open the crock of shit. The crock of doo-doo. Let's hey, do it. no swearing. <laughs> Profanity allows people who, we'll get to that in the blurs. <laughs> let's open it up in a segment called Plot Time. Tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 that was a cuckoo clock where little cowboys come out and shoot into the air on the hour. The yeah, last one. This is turning into a Western episode. Yeah. <laughs> even, though, even though it's in upstate New York mostly. If you never heard the show, this is where we talk about what happens in the book. And Hocus yeah. Pocus is built around the story of Eugene Debs Hartke, who becomes a teacher at a college called Tarkington College in upstate New York, and also a teacher at the prison across the way. And we kind of bounce between the college and the prison and the war in Vietnam, I'd say, are sort of our Definitely. three locales of the whole way. It takes place in the near future, and I think it's important to note right out of the gate, Tarkington College has a Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Fountain. Yeah, that was So really I like that a prediction he made is, I'll be famous. They'll make stuff <laughs> named after me. <laughs> and he's not wrong. Well, it felt not so much to me like he's like celebrating himself. It just felt like a weird, like, obviously we all know I'm my main character and I'm throughout my own books. Let's just keep playing that out. Maybe like, he just could not mention his own name at least once in a book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, also, actually, yeah, that's also kind of universe breaky because when we, the, the very beginning of this book, it's a lot like the structure of Mother Night, where Mother Night is supposed to be written by the main character, Howard W. Campbell, and then it's being edited by an editor who's Kurt Vonnegut. And this book is written by Eugene Debs Hartke, the main character, and then it's edited by Kurt Vonnegut. So it's a author's note, or editor's note, I should say, from Kurt Vonnegut for his fictional character's fictional book that he wrote. Yes. And he explains basically how the guy wrote the book, which is he calls himself Gene throughout. But yeah, Eugene Hardke is waiting trial for his complicity, accused complicity in a giant prison outbreak and subsequent riot. And yeah. they are holding him in the college campus library because the college has since also been converted into a prison. Yeah. It reminded me a lot of classic gore fest Ricky O, the story of Ricky. A famous, I don't know what uh, that is at a all. famous B movie that everyone should watch if they like cheesy gore. <laughs> uh, do you remember The Daily Show back when Craig Kilborn hosted it and they did five questions with the head exploding? No. Okay. Well, the shot peeps. Some people will. So I didn't yeah. say it in vain. The head exploding yeah, shot yeah, is yeah. from a great movie called Ricky O, the story of Ricky that you should watch, where oh. in the futuristic wor- year of two thousand one, <laughs> the entire world has been converted into a prison. Uh, oh, the whole planet. Which makes no sense because it doesn't imply we're on any other planets. It's just now everyone's agreed to be in prison. <laughs> but my point is, this is also a book about the year 2001 where 
essentially everything is being converted into a prison. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is very Blade Runner or something. Yeah, yeah. And that the future year where everything's happening is now. It's or, all or for the profit past. prisons also, yeah. <laughs> Um, so he's basically writing an autobiography that he hopes to prove his innocence for the coming trial. Yeah. Much like the dude in Mother Night, although he wasn't trying to prove his innocence, he was sort admitting of... everything he did and then hanging himself. This guy doesn't kill himself. <laughs> yeah. In that way, maybe it's brighter? Maybe not. Except it still ends with a suicide, way True. more vicious than a hanging. True. <laughs> yeah. It's like... It's a rough time. It's very Mother Nighty. Yeah. It's a guy writing his confession, and at the end of confession, a main character dies grotesquely. It yeah. just doesn't happen to be the main character himself. <laughs> And another kind of world-building thing that he does right away is Vonnegut, the editor, says this whole book was written on scraps of paper and other pages that he ripped out of books in the library. So this is, I'll put lines between where the pages stop and start. So it's the same sort of style that Vonnegut always does in his writing, but in this one it is, in the universe of the book, just scribbled on random pieces of paper. Like, he didn't have a typewriter Well, that's the anything. excuse for yeah. his chapters being one sentence long sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I bet he wishes he stumbled on that way early in his career and could have said every character was doing that, because that would yeah, explain yeah. his whole writing style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All his characters are maniacs. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So from that, we then go to a dedication, which is dedicated to Eugene Victor Debs, who it was a real person. He was one of the famous leaders of the Socialist Party of America in the early 1920s and from Indiana. So obviously Vonnegut's a fan of him. And he's brought him up in previous books too. And he does that famous quote about... Yeah, it's, the while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. While there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Yeah. I have a picture of Martin Luther King on my mantle that says, no man is free until all men are free. And yeah, I keep it there nice. as a reminder of how a gendered speech does harm to our community. Because, you know, why not people? Martin Luther King. No. All due respect. <laughs> Hail to the king. So, obviously, the book's going to focus on social justice and the movement of money and social systems. And then, yeah. does your book also have the picture of a bunch of stick figures? Okay. Yes. I think so that also, was important to Kurt for some reason. I think it is important. I actually, yeah, I, a, uh, I think it all tied in really, really well. This might be of all his books, the most effective use of his line art, I think. I think he does a great job. Which is in between the quote we just read you and the beginning of chapter one, there's just a blank field with a bunch of stick figures on it. Yeah. What did you take that to mean? I actually couldn't wring meaning out of that. So I, so mine, did yours also have a field of them at the end? No. Oh. Ah, so because mine... I read the Kindle version. Mine no, also didn't. has another field. <gasps> and they're all women. Yeah. Ah, uh, I see. So it's yeah. Bluebeard <laughs> in two drawings. <laughs> yeah, because they throughout this book, there's going to be a question, and then eventually it's briefly a mystery that he pays off with a math equation of Eugene Debs Hartke knows that he has killed oh, and shit, adultered I just with figured out what it means. the oh. exact same amount of people. Sorry. And so at the opening of the book, there's a bunch of drawings of stick figures. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know what that means. And then in the book, he'll say that, oh, if I was an airplane, I would have a bunch of little stick figures on the side of me because I've killed That's or how adulted many people so I much. Killed, yeah. And then at the end of my copy, there's another field of stick figures, but they all have that little dress that like a female bathroom sign has. Right. And so it pays off that the one Duh. field was people he killed, and then the exact same number is, is ladies he adultered with. Which has so much meaning in it all throughout the book. A lot of the women that he sleeps with, he kills in some way. He uses women and discards them. And he talks about getting high on the act of killing someone in a sexual way. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, really I cool. would have figured it out if my copy had the stupid other half. Yeah, because like Kindles <laughs> yeah. do that thing where it just ends it just too ends. soon and they don't show you. Yeah. I also would have. <laughs> I I assumed this was just finally we get to see a literal depiction of what the painting at the end of Bluebeard looks like. This is what Sears Berman saw. It is, and I was like, yeah. it's not that good. It's just a bunch of stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just. <laughs> she was just being polite. He's like, that stick figure is my dead mom. That stick figure is a Polish guy who grew up in and she's like they're all just stick figures man <laughs> say something nice say something nice it's like <laughs> what's him i want to say it's naked gun there's some comedy movie where like as, uh, the main character's painting and then it flips around and it's just a dumb stick figure or like thing. a smiley like, face yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why well, and that actually we can go ahead and start and end a segment called vana art oh whoa art 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 in art, the art, midst art. of the plot art, we art, spied art. an art, art and art, then art. we thought We'd have a fart. Sorry, it's all that rhymed. <laughs>
Cool. My hand was forced. <laughs> hey, it's the way it's the way the words play. It's the way the words with it. play. Because that's the most exciting thing to me about the art in this is how that drawing paid off. Because because Vonnegut, as we've said, is not usually big on mystery. He does do a little bit of mystery with that number in this, but that drawing was a really cool payoff for me. And then the only other drawings in this are a couple of tombstones. One of them is that Deb's quote we just said that is in a tombstone in my copy. Yes, there's yeah. three actually, and the third one is my favorite moment in the book, or at least was the most emotionally affecting for me. And oh, it okay, might yeah. be, again, I don't know if it's the Kindle's fault, but it had that effect where I turned the page and the only thing on the page was the tombstone, which oh, is an nice. elegant way to present it, and I don't know if that's just by chance. But the first tombstone is just some people's names, and that's just to set up the theme that there will be tombstones. I honestly got the impression. The second tombstone yeah. is a quote from a guy who he agrees with, and he says it could be Earth's epitaph. And it's the very famous Vonnegut quote, we could have saved it, but we were too doggone cheap. <laughs> Which I think is funny because whenever I see it quoted on Twitter, people say too goddamn cheap. And technically, he does say right after that, he didn't say doggone though. Yeah, yeah. But the protagonist never swears in the book, very importantly. Which I think is a great tactic because it's like Vonnegut's whole thing is everyone right said his books were sewer books because he swore so much. So he wrote a book without a single swear in it that's the most grotesque, upsetting book that he's ever written. <laughs> it's genius. Which is clever, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I just think it's funny. It's like the Luke, I am your father versus no, I am your father thing. The quote is actually doggone, not goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third one is the end of an amazing arc. And this plot is so splintered by the guy's ramblings. I don't know how we're going to tackle it, but I'll let you regain control. But, uh, but as far as art goes, there's this arc in the book that doesn't affect the main plot much about a dude in town. You end up knowing everything about everyone in the whole town. Yeah. It's very intense. It's very, it reminded me of the painting of Bluebeard because we look very closely at sort of a pageant of people. Like, it reminded me of, of a... Grandpa Simpson because there were many parts where he goes... And of no consequence, I passed Darby Walker. Darby Walker's parents came from the old country in 1912. <laughs> he had a bum leg and sold a spittoon to buy a horse, which later died. You're like, yeah. shut up, Grandpa. I don't care. <laughs> Get to the riot. But, okay, so there's this dude. I forget his name. Who owns the Black Cat Cafe? Lyle Hooper. Lyle Hooper. Yeah. And he owns the Black Cat Cafe, which everyone in town loves. It's a nice pub. But everyone knows he obviously makes his money and stays in business because there's prostitutes in the parking lot, and they split their money with him for protection yeah. of being in the parking lot. Well, in the riot where a bunch of people get taken hostages after the prisoners escape, they call him Pimp because they've heard that rumor. And so they're like, you over there, you over there, Pimp in the corner. And he's like devastated and has this existential crisis because he had felt – he had always deluded himself enough to think, like he asked people around him, wasn't I a pillar of the community? Didn't I do more good than bad? My dad always said, just leave Earth better than you found it. Didn't I? And people are like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Basically because they know he's about to get executed. Yeah. The prisoners execute him, and his last words as he's getting dragged out are, and then you turn the page, or at least I flipped my Kindle page, and his last yeah. words are represented on a tombstone. And it's, okay, I admit it, it really was a whorehouse. Yeah. Which I think if you're following the symbology of, well, the tombstones in sequence have been fitting epitaphs for planet Earth, it's also a chilling epitaph for planet Earth, for like what humans have done to planet Earth. That's pretty cool. Like as we go down yeah. to our graves, our last words are, okay, we admit it. Like we knew we were fucking the planet. We just <laughs> hoped that we would die before. I hoped my kids would get fucked, you know? Like, okay, oh, yeah, I admit yeah. it, it really was a whorehouse. And it's, that was very devastating to me. Oh, that's amazing. Well, and they're also, I, I really like that thread of the tombstones all being epitaphs for the earth. Because there's also, at the, ver at the very end when he's talking about his riddle and the number that is, mm -hmm. is going to be the number, there's also in mine a picture of a tombstone with just a question mark on it. Yes. So maybe that's too. sort of a hopeful tombstone. If that oh, if that's toward the end of the book, I never. It's not a particularly hopeful for book, hope, but, but, yeah. <laughs> maybe but totally, that in. it could say the future's not written, as well as this is for you to plug in the number of how many people I killed, yeah. which is great, man. It, because that's the, what, what Vonnegut always comes back to: is everything is what you make it. Abstract art is the experience you have with it. Life is only what you perceive it to be. Of course, yeah. Of course, he'd end with a question mark. It's cool, yeah. And, He's one and of the, the only authors whose voice justifies an ending that goes, the end, question mark? <laughs> and it's not hokey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And even in the, in this book, he questions his own ability to put a the end on 
the story and then a few other ones he has too where like he says that no in real life stories don't have the ends like it just keeps going and and there's not that resolution which i think he literalizes in another clever way it's one of his most accomplished books from a technique point of view i think really yeah he and seems especially the art. Yeah. so in possession right whereas before the art was an experiment some of them didn't seem to have a lot of meaning or were thrown in for fun the art here like man he's He's winnowed his formula down to like, I know what I do, and this is what I do. Yeah. Like everything's spare and perfect. He only has four pieces of art, and they're all very meaningful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So sorry, I lost it's the my best. Thought, though, but it's no, great. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm glad we could dive right into that because yeah, we can keep going with the plot, but the art is so uh, very beginning and very end loaded that it feels worth yeah considering because it's so well chosen. So that's our brief setup for getting into this book that Vonnegut pretended yeah. to edit and actually wrote. I find the plot very difficult to encapsulate. Take a run at it, Alex. It is. Yeah. Um, Eugene Debs Hartke is born in Delaware. Then he grows up in Midland City, Ohio. And he has a father who is very, very difficult to live with because, uh, he, well, he also he has a socialist grandfather named Benjamin who insists that he have a name after Eugene Debs, the great socialist. But in actuality, Eugene Debs Hartke's father pushes him, rather than being a journalist and being what he says would make him happy, pushes him into West Point, especially after they try to do a science fair. Not and... the original Eugene Debs, our Eugene Debs. That was yeah. just mildly confusing. Yeah, right. His father pushes him into doing a science fair. Oh, that's fair. so confusing. Yeah, so Eugene <laughs> V. Debs, the real person, is only a touchstone in this book. He's never Right, we never learn about his life from this book. <laughs> yeah, other than that one quote, and yeah. he's mentioned some. So when we talk about Eugene Debs Hartke, we're talking about the character <laughs> in the book. And his father tries to get some kind of positive thing going that he can talk to the neighbors about. And so his first well, idea... Because I think it's important to note, because the protagonist will famously later become addicted to the act of adultery. Yeah. The main devastation in his childhood was his family's reputation was totally shot in town when his father was like discovered sleeping with the wife of an important man in town. Yeah. And the guy like beat the crap out of him and threw him into the street and everyone saw... Yeah, right. And now his father desperately wants to do anything that makes him feel good, no matter what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he'd and say his son is like, well, the science fair is coming up. And he's like, God damn it, son, you're going to win that science fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's also and his dad is uh, some kind of industrial chemist. Uh, he, uh, he works for a lot of big companies, including I think one of the ones that made napalm because this is a Vietnam book quite a bit. Well, it was originally uh, I forget the name, but it's a company that made napalm and then became Barry Tron. Of course, a recurring character. Oh, yeah. Who made washing machines. Robo and then, magic. And Barry Trump, it's Robo Magic who make Napalm. Yeah. Then as he works for them when they make washing machines and he innovates new kinds of plastics that take longer to degrade, yeah. which is called out in the book as his great sin. He didn't create an atom bomb, but he invented that styrofoam cup that will never degrade. He invented it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And will pollute forever. Right. So um, he he doesn't admire his father very much, to say the least. And his father, of course, because he's a scientist, is like we're going to win the science fair hands down, buddy. Just let me help a little. And then, of course, is like, leave me alone, kid. I got this. And he makes this amazing science display that is clearly cheating. Like, no right. child could make it. It's <laughs> clearly made by an adult scientist with amazing equipment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're caught immediately. They're caught, they're caught immediately. It's utterly humiliating for Again. <laughs> his dad and him. And then while they're kind of trying to work their way out of this new humiliation, there's a guy named Sam Wakefield who's tied to West Point who sees uh, Eugene Debs Hartke leaving the building and he describes it as a situation where if he'd gone any other direction in this building, he never would have run into Sam Wakefield and he would have gone through a door to the University of Michigan Journalism School and probably a totally different, happy, contented life. But instead he runs into Sam Wakefield who recruits him for West Point and he's put into the army and then he becomes a soldier in Vietnam from there. What's the word in Cass Cradle that the carass revolves around? Was it a womp eater? Womp eater or a womp eater. 
Uh, Sam Wakefield is clearly his Womp Eater. Yeah, Womp, womp Eater is the object that they revolve around. Okay, so the yeah. Womp Eater is an re- object that like influences the path your life ultimately takes, whether it seems sensible or not. And Sam Wakefield is his, because he says literally three times, he's Frank Wertanen also, basically, yeah, for basically, Mother Night. Basically. He shows up at three crucial points, says the same line. What's the hurry, son? <laughs> what's the hurry, son? And then <laughs> says, you should go to West Point. And the second time he goes, what's the hurry, son? You should work at Target college like he always just tells him what to do and i think in a way he's just like i was at the mercy of any father figure or authority figure that seemed competent and he did so i did whatever he said yeah and then of course the irony is sam wakefield will eventually blow his brains out and leave a suicide note that makes it very very clear that he's not entirely sure why he blew his brains out and he's not sure what life was all about and yeah. so it's weird to think that was the guy I was taking all my cues from. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he makes a point of the note is just, my work is done. And Eugene Debtaki makes a point of saying, he stole that from George Eastman, the guy who founded Kodak and yeah. committed suicide. And he's like, and when life. I heard George he Eastman's even... note, I thought, weak suicide note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't even like he didn't even have a unique or thoughtful plan for killing right. himself. Wakefield was just a guy, and mm. I've been following him my entire life. But yeah, he gets him into West Point, which his dad is very pleased by because it's a thing to be proud of. Because then, yeah, finally that for him. And from there, he will head to Vietnam, have terrible experiences fighting in Vietnam. But also, maybe one of the worst things for him going forward is that he enjoyed the killing in Vietnam. And so he is weighed down by that and weighed down by how much killing he did and also how much promoting of killing he did to the rest of the troops. Right, like how many people he killed because he was eventually put in recruitment and did a good job and would say things like, no, it's not unsafe. You'll find a camaraderie like you never knew. Knowing their lies, but that's his job. And then he's like, I wonder how many of those guys died. (laughs) Um, But also just... It's a bit Lawrence of Arabia, which has a famous scene where he comes back from his first battle and they're like, why are you so shaken? It's not because he shot someone. It's because he shot someone he realized he really enjoys shooting people. Yeah. And that's what's upsetting him. That movie's so good. Oh, it's very, very good. Yeah, Lawrence of Arabia, recommended viewing. it's the best. But uh, in this case, I just think it's important to note how he's unique in every Kurt Vonnegut protagonist who's been through war in that every other one either... Never got a chance to shoot someone? Got a chance. But you know what I mean. Which is not that unique. A lot of people go through a war without actually knowing whether they killed someone. They might fire a mortar, but they they didn't see someone they killed. And and if they did kill someone, it's, as you'd expect, the most tragic thing in their life, and they only feel sad about it. This guy alternates... And it's very unlikable and weird feeling. Like, (laughs) he talks about throwing a grenade that kills a woman, her mother, and the baby she was holding. And he calls it like a three-in-one. Like, it's pretty impressive, right? (laughs) Three-in-one. And he talks about a dude, an enemy combatant they were taking to, like, a POW camp in a helicopter. And the dude spits in his face, so he threw him out of the helicopter to his death. That's not okay at all in any context. Like, you know, spitting doesn't warrant that. So, yeah, I just think it's important when you go through the whole book to know that this dude, like, has the highest body count by far of any Kurt Vonnegut soldier and is more into it than any Kurt Vonnegut character before. Yeah. Or at least there were times where he was. It's a definite shift. And I I, I felt like it was partly Vonnegut trying to make something out of Vietnam without it being the war he fought in, because so many of his other books go back to World War II and Mm. go back to his own thing. Even Bluebeard, the previous novel, drew directly on World War II. And now he's like, well, I finally got to do something with... Vietnam that is such a momentous yeah. event in American history and he I think did a pretty good job of finding a way to make something out of it without it being personal to his own life like he yeah. made something out of it by totally. looking at oh if I felt this completely other way about killing and if I had this completely different experience with it here's what the book would be here's yeah. what the story would be <laughs> yeah well it just shows how context well let's get into it in the meat yeah so where are we science yeah, fair sorry. west yeah, point yeah. So he, he meets he, his friend Jack Patton at West Point. He's top of the class. Jack is bottom of the class. They're an unlikely pair of pals who will pal around until Jack is killed in the war. And uh, Jack is in particular very, very nihilistic about it uh, in a way that 
jumps out to him because because yeah you, uh, Eugene is much more clearly affected about him. him yeah yeah uh, Jack keeps saying you got to laugh like hell about every terrible thing but he says about happens. anything he'll say it about something genuinely funny like did you see that Marx Brothers oh yeah, yeah. I had to laugh like hell did you hear they <laughs> dropped an atom bomb on Manhattan oh yeah I had to laugh like hell yeah. and towards the end of their arc when he asks like how can you do that he goes I don't know I must have a screw loose I just can't care about anything more or less than anything else. So like maybe he was a sociopath or who knows. Well, he, cause, yeah, because he yeah. even says or, that about... or he's so shell shocked that he's lost the capacity through Vietnam. Yeah, because they. I think one of the last ones is Jack had ordered a napalm strike. He's counted the bodies after and under orders to do so. He counted every body as an enemy body, even though who knows. And then received a silver star for it. And when he's asked about it, he's like, I had to laugh like hell. you know, Because I might have <laughs> killed eight American soldiers and I got awarded. Whereas and our, I might have presented right, it as we as, killed eight right. VC. Yeah. Well, because they just wanted high numbers towards the end of the war to look good. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, if the body's burned to the point where it can't be recognized, say that it was a strapping Viet Cong who was coming <laughs> right at you and you heroically napalmed him. Yeah. yeah. And similarly, Eugene gets his highest honor for crawling into a tunnel and killing five people with his bare hands. And he points out that a lot of this book takes place in prison. And there's a lot of prisoners who were there for life with no chance of parole because they killed two people with their bare hands. Like, what's the difference? It's, does, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he, of course, Funny. doesn't go to jail for those crimes. He's a war hero. <laughs> yeah, and he, uh, he even, when the war is ending, Eugene describes being on one of the last helicopters out of Saigon and being airlifted out of it at the last minute. Billy um, Joel blasting Goodnight Saigon <laughs> on the speakers, you can imagine. <laughs> oh, Billy Joel. I as think he... sharp as knives, knives, <laughs> knives. <laughs> he, I think he was my first experience of Vietnam. Is that weird? Good I was night, way Saigon. into Billy Joel as a kid. Goodnight yeah. Saigon <laughs> made me, yeah, ask my parents, like, what's, what's, what happened to Saigon? It sounded yeah, sad. Yeah. sounded sad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember also trying to find out what a cola war was. There you go. <laughs> but we didn't start the fire. Thank you, BJ. On the way back from Vietnam, he stops in Manila. He has sex with a reporter from the Des Moines Register, and unbeknownst to him until late in life when he's writing this book, he has an illegitimate son with her. The son will be named Rob Roy after the drinks they were having. And <laughs> so that will be one of his kids. He returns to the States and gets married to his uh, wife, Margaret, and has two kids with her. He also knows, because he's in the future, that his wife, Margaret, got a gene from her mother, Mildred, that will make them both completely insane by a certain age. And also yeah. his kids hate uh, hate him and hate them because they know they probably have the insanity Because they fear too. going crazy so much and they blame their parents for reproducing. Yeah. And that makes, I feel like, a couple of Vonnegut books in a row where somebody has had some terrible congenital thing. Like Galapagos, they had yes. that dancing disease. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he knows that and he resents them. And they resent him. <laughs> he cares for his wife and mother-in-law after they go nuts for a long time. Yeah. So he gets back from Vietnam. He is, as he says, dissolute with marijuana, alcohol, and other chemicals. And Sam Wakefield enters his life yet again. I forget exactly how, but it's not important. Yeah. But Sam Wakefield, his wampeter guy, his Frank Wartanen in Mother Night parlance, comes and says, hey, what's the hurry, son? Is that his catchphrase? Yeah, what's the, yeah, hurry, what's son? the hurry, son? Yeah. This time he says, I'm the uh, dean of this cool school called Tarkington. You should come teach there. They're hiring teachers. You don't have to have a teaching credential because it is a school for the developmentally disabled children of incredibly wealthy people. Yeah. So it's a place where the very rich send their kids who they feel are inferior or not sufficient <laughs> To go to, like, other schools or the prestigious schools they'd like to send them to, they send them to a remedial school, but they can't send them to a regular one, right? They have to yeah. hide them in a distant school far away, tucked away in this valley called Mohica Valley. And it needs to have Ivy League vibes. So and, yeah, and that. it needs to be really well-appointed and rich and posh because yeah. they want their kids to be at home, I guess. And we're and this book is incredibly time jumpy and the actual order of things you're told, one of the first things you find out is the history of this school called Tarkington College. And it was initially called the Mohiga Valley Free Institute. And it was supposed to be a thing that, you know, just taught locals and raised them as people. But the whole point was for free. It was providing yeah. free education to anyone in town who showed up. Right. And it and slowly the morphed into and, yeah. the most prestigious, expensive school. 
yeah. to hide your developmentally disabled kid at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to like keep the rich rich, like to give rich people's children an education where they could enter the powerful group of rich people, even though they weren't smart or had some sort of developmental issue. Right. And he points yeah. out that a lot of them really are smart and that they just have something going on with them that the family deems not seemly. Yeah. Like they're dyslexic to the point that they can't read, but their IQ is otherwise very high. If you read it to them, they can memorize it. They have thoughts about it. They know what to do. Or they just have a debilitating stutter or whatever. And they're like, just hide them in this valley, please. <laughs> so that's why you don't need a teaching credential because it's really just like a daycare for rich kids. Yeah. And he works there for a long time and he's very happy there because it's an easy job and they let him play the bells, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a big there's a big carol on there, and uh, Eugene goes into a lot of description about how the carillon bells have received all kinds of work from a specialist in Belgium and all kinds of money for them. And like they just the school just got bells, assuming they would have the money to build a tower for them later. And yeah, he just teaches physics because that's what he got his bachelor's at West Point in. And then he does bell ringing and just sort of moonlights on other classes as needed. And he's very happy doing kind of made up educational work borderline. Yeah. Like it's not really even teaching almost. Well, he'll, but he does projects with them. Like he found yeah. in the attic a bunch of old attempts that one of the original deans of the college had at building perpetual motion machines. Yeah. And of course they don't work, but they're these really cool you know, curly cue things with balls that bearings that go down a funnel and go up a thing and they're all beautiful. So like he had the class restore them all and explain some of the basic physics of why that lever, why did, even though it doesn't work, why did he think it would work? What principles of physics is he applying? Whatever. So he's like a decent teacher. Everyone likes him, except for the fact that he fucks every, <laughs> he obsessively, addictively fucks every yeah. other teacher's wife whenever he can. He yeah. never gets caught somehow for a long time. He does eventually, but <laughs> people like him even though he's fucking all their wives. They don't know. Several of the wives fall in love with him. Da 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 da. Teaching, teaching, teaching. <laughs> we dip in and out, but like I want to get to then his teaching career ends. Yeah. Due to this sort of Shakespeare in love witch hunt is what I want to call it. If you saw, <laughs> saw Shakespeare in Love, it was a movie where their main trick, which was clever, is it shows Shakespeare living his normal life and like something happens and he goes, well, those sure were two gentlemen from Verona. And you're like, oh, that's where he got the idea for that. <laughs> you know, it implants all the things. Romeo and Juliet is two friends of his, and that's how he got the idea. <laughs> it truly was a Henry IV part yes, two. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but my point is the recontextualizing in the past of everything. So now he's going to be put on trial for, like, sedition against America. Yeah. And all this very mundane shit you've seen him do that you never thought was a problem is going to come back and be presented in trial very conveniently as like, this is un-American, this is un-American. You said Jesus is a drunk asshole. And he's like, <laughs> actually, I was quoting my grandfather and it was a long speech that said this and this and this. And they're like, we have you on tape saying Jesus is a drunk asshole. End of story. <laughs> yeah, the context is for the most part redeeming, but they're not interested in the context. Like There are a few times where he does say something that they just find un-American and that's what he meant. But most of the time, in particular because he had a friend who was the history professor named Damon Stern and he makes a point of Damon Stern being the source of most of this stuff and he was just like laughing along or repeating but Stern does not get fired at all and Eugene does mainly because they really want to get rid of him for all of the adultery stuff. Right. So what happened is there's this uh, Rush Limbaugh type analog, and I don't think Rush actually was prominent yet, so he must... It's a really interesting character because his name's Jason Wilder, and he's a conservative pundit kind of guy who's an extreme, like... But a uh, populist, populist who doesn't care about facts as yeah. much. And for this being So like very in... bombastic and just like getting the people fired up, which is why I say Rush more than like yeah. a Cronkite or something. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah, he's not like Buckley Yeah, he's not a journalist. He's yeah. a Pundit. He's yeah. a pundit. Yeah. And I and I am I'm kind of amazed Vonnegut could write that character in 1990. I right. felt like that wasn't much of a thing yet. He predicted a kind of punditry that is he, accurate. He, called, but he it, it saw was, Fox News coming. It somehow. was just barely beginning then, so it's yeah. very impressive. Yeah. But there's this fully fleshed Rush Limbaugh type character. No pun intended. You fat bastard. <laughs> um, fully fleshed out character uh, who is. Uh, spying on the school by he wired up his developmentally disabled niece yeah. and told her to just record the goings on about the school. Nominally, we never know if it's true or not. It might be his daughter. I don't know. Daughter? If, yeah. Okay, his daughter, Kimberly, right? 
Well, Alex looks that up. I will just explain that he wires her up purportedly because he's researching a book about Tarkington because he thinks it's such a great place. But then when he hears this one professor, daughter, I got a nod, daughter Kimberly, he's exploiting a developmentally disabled kid as the takeaway yeah. point yeah, yeah. Um, to spy on teachers. <laughs> and when he realizes, oh, one of these teachers makes communist jokes and his name is Eugene Debs, he's like, this is juicy. I hate people like that, so I'm going to fuck this guy. Yeah. And he's fabulously wealthy, so he hires private eyes to look into everything about him and find bad stuff. Yeah. So they find all the stuff used at the trial, plus naturally, as a bonus that he wasn't expecting, they find out he's fucked every single other teacher's wife. So all and, he has to do is tell them, and the president of the college. Yeah, and everyone. most often and most prominently the college president's yeah. wife. Yeah. So all he has to do is tell all these people who otherwise totally would have stood up for him at the trial. Uh, here's a picture of him fucking all your wives, and they go, oh, fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah. So they easily, he gets ousted, yeah. And then he's fired from that, and then the book spends a lot of time on a very short time period. It's basically him walking from the meeting when he where he's been fired down into the town to the Black Cat Cafe, which is this bar and whorehouse, as we said. But it's a good 15% of the book's page length, which is yeah. very interesting. Time it, telescopes wildly With in this probably, book. I don't know, 10 characters he talks to. There's a lot of, like, from his firing on, it feels very pageanty. It feels yeah. very, like, and now this person that means something, and now that person <laughs> yeah. that means something, and he's just wandering his way down, yeah. Yeah, a little Finnegan's Wakey, maybe. Yeah, he sees, I think, at least two women that he is in the middle of breaking off an affair with. Because there's Zuzu yes. Johnson, who's the wife of Henry Johnson, the professor of the college, and then also Pamela Ford Hall, who was the artist in residence that he also had an affair with. And so he breaks up with both of them and also meets other students, and it's a whole a And whole they circus. get their chance to tell him that he's a dick for the way he handled things. Yeah. Basically, he gets a double whammy twice in a row. So then he's like, then I walk to the black hat trying not to run into anyone at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he also... And he he doesn't run into uh, Paul Slazinger, who is in this book, and we saw him Bluebeard, yeah. and became the writer in residence at the college, and then got a MacArthur Genius Grant and immediately left. He was like, I'm out. But he's yes. earlier in the book as another friend of his that is on the tapes that he's been talking to. Well, and he's held up as an example of someone who said way more seditious shit. Like, he explicitly said in a speech to the students, America is shit, or something along yeah. those lines. And they're like, they gave him a Genius Grant. So he's just like, why? Why? <laughs> and they're like, well, I don't hate him. I'm, you know, I hate you and I'm rich, right. so I just found a way to fuck you that's the real reality of this he hasn't sex with my wife right so i don't care yeah he can go he hasn't had sex <laughs> so then he uh has to pee <laughs> so he whips out his ding dong is literally the quote from the book yeah. and he finds it pointed at a very nice italian racing bicycle he imagines to himself that one of the rich spoiled brats from the school just abandoned it because they it wasn't the one they wanted or whatever. So basically he talks himself into it not being a big deal if he steals it. And it sounds fun to go on a bike ride. So he rides his bike to the black cat. Then a dude comes in going, who the fuck stole my son's bike? It's outside the bar. Yeah. Or is my son here? And they're like, no, your son didn't come in. And he's like, then which one of you assholes stole my son's bike? <laughs> and he plays dumb. And he's like, anyway, I have an appointment. The other guy, I got to get out of here. I'm going to the prison because they're hiring teachers. And he takes the bike and throws it in the bed of his truck. And our guy, of course, says, what a coinky dink. I'm a teacher who was just fired. Can I come with you and interview? So he goes now across the valley to a prison that Alex and I haven't mentioned, but it has been mentioned throughout the book. Yeah, it's const there's constantly a college and prison parallel the whole time. Yes. And the they're valleys, across the lake from each other. The valley is basically a small hamlet dominated on one side by the college and on the other side by the prison. Yeah. And at the start of the book, and it's the start of Eugene Time in the valley, the prison was the same size at the, as the college. Now, in the present... The college has like 500 students and the prison has 10,000 prisoners. Yeah, and it's massively overcrowded. It's clearly yes. a terrible place. It's compared to Attica or Sing Sing, which are actual New York prisons that are the worst prisons for the worst criminals. Yeah. Yes, it's also racially segregated, which I don't think is real. I think he was yeah. predicting something that he thought might happen, but it didn't. Yeah, it actually, in, in the world of the book, the Supreme Court hands down a decision that says prisons need to be segregated because it's cruel and unusual to have different races of people in the same prison. Because they're going to fight, because that's what different races do. But I don't think our Supreme Court is willing to admit that or give up on the ideal that we could get along. Actually, <laughs> That didn't cool, actually happen, did I it? I googled around. Cool fun fact. Uh -huh. In 2005, the Supreme Court in real life said that prison segregation should be very strictly scrutinized. We should not segregate prisons unless there's an incredibly important reason to do it. 
So in, in actual yeah. life, we've done the opposite with prisons. But it, it's interesting yeah. that he makes like five bold near future predictions and like three are wrong and two are right. That's pretty good. But yeah, they're like oh, yeah, eerily yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's important to the plot of this book, because of course the race issue is going to come in, that in his world of the future, and again, I don't, this is not accurate, Sing Sing is the white prison. Yeah, uh, and then was Atticus it Rikers, is, the Hispanic prison, or Rikers, Rikers is the Hispanic yeah. prison, and this fictional one, Athena, yeah. is the black person's prison. Uh, here's another prediction he made that did kind of happen. All prisons have become for profit because of the war on drugs has expanded the need for prisons so greatly, and because they're not good at making profit, they've largely been sold to foreign interests. Yeah. So the warden of Athena prison and all the guards are Japanese people who have never set foot in America before and don't speak English yeah. other than the warden, which is amazing because, <laughs> and they all wear face masks and rubber gloves because they think Americans are filthy. So he is a white dude going to try and be a teacher at an all black prison run by all Japanese people. That's all. <laughs> it's just yeah. weird. And he, and he makes a point of saying that the U.S. economy has really cratered. It's not full on Mad Max apocalypse or something, but it's to the point but where Virgin, Japan owns yeah. most of the country. And he says only the wealthy have gasoline nowadays towards the end, which is quite a statement. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. In the in the present day. Like yeah, people yeah. have to go to the black market and haggle for thousands of dollars to fill up their car tank, which is a pretty grim assessment of our economic future. <laughs> yeah. But not unrealistic to things that like the Soviet Union saw at different points of economic collapse. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when he goes for this job interview to be a teacher there, he meets with the warden who is Hiroshi Matsumoto. He's a Japanese person who survived the bombing of Hiroshima because he was fetching a soccer ball out of a ditch. Like they were all playing soccer and the ball rolled in there and he was like, I'll get it. And he leaned down in the ditch to get it. And then the bomb went off and he turned back around and everyone's dead. <laughs> They've been yeah. hit by an atomic bomb. And he said it created his whole character, which I think is a great point because... In his early childhood, his formative experience is one day everything that was real can disappear and become just a flat plane of nothing. Yeah. And so he always acts as if nothing's real. And he is kind of subdued and objective in that way. Yeah. And not invested in life much. And of course, <laughs> he'll end up killing himself, as I already spoiled. Yeah. And it seems like out of boredom, out of just like, well, that's the end of that chapter. Yeah, it's very, and it's Harakiri too. Like, it's Hari, very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, which is if I'm sure you know, but stabbing yourself in the stomach and letting yourself die very painfully as a form of self punishment that Japanese historically would do, like Sam, disgraced samurai and stuff. A few of them, yeah. But to show, yeah, it didn't happen as often as we yeah. like to think it did, actually. <laughs> but it did happen. It's happened before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But of course, it's a much bigger deal. Like we act like the Wild West, everyone got shot twice a day, and, you know, that did, it happened occasionally. <laughs> but the point is, the symbolism of it is very much like, I hate myself, I deserve to die, I'm sorry. And I think it's very ironic if you compare it to Mother Night. This main character is way worse than the Mother Night guy. Yeah. Not Walter Starbuck. What's well, his Howard name? Campbell. Howard Campbell. They're all blurring. Um, <laughs> this guy's intentions are wrong a lot of the time, whereas Howard Campbell was trying to do good. Yeah. Howard Campbell feels so bad that he hangs himself. And similarly, Matsumoto, the warden, uh, is explicitly described as one of the kindest people Certainly the kindest person in the book. Yeah. He tries to make the prisoners' lives better, even though his superiors tell him, don't waste the money. Why are you doing this? He, it's his idea that they teach the prisoners. There's no need to do that. Yeah. He tries to provide free medical service. And then he commits Harry Carey. And I think it's a statement about survivor's guilt and about how, like, he's killing himself because he thinks he should have died in the atomic bomb. Yeah, because other than like that, it. there's nothing in his life that he ever did wrong. It's like he was a perfect citizen from then on to see if his guilt feeling would go away, and it didn't, so he just checked out. Yeah. And yeah. that's really also devastating. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, then, and then we're there for a while, like Eugene has Two this years. job teaching. They become friends. Yeah, they become friends. Vaguely. And then a prison break happens, and the prisoners yes. get out. And we find out the real reason, but the public never knows, is a Jamaican drug cartel yep. just wants to save one dude from the prison. So they run in, blow up the wall, save that dude, vanish as quickly as possible. They're super pro, and they're never heard from again. However, they didn't bother to, like, wall up the prison again, so it's right. just open now. And they, and I think they made all the guards run away or something like that. Like, they removed all barriers to the prisoners just leaving. That's why it's important that the guards are all Japanese, because yeah. the Japanese, and they don't speak English, the Jamaicans know this, and they drive in in army trucks that they stole 
with American flags playing, claiming to be the army, and saying that Japan's now an enemy of America and you have to leave. And they all evacuate because they, yeah. are, they are themselves a in a foreign land where they don't speak. They see the American flag and they're threatened by it. Yeah. yeah. And it's just their job. Right. It's not a war. Yeah. So all the guards run into the hills. All the prisoners escape. And unfortunately, it's the dead of winter. So the giant lake that leads directly from the prison to the school is frozen over. Yeah. And the, the mob of zombie-like prisoners, which is problematic, <laughs> I would say, we'll get to it in what, yeah. starts to gather guns and shamble across the lake looking for revenge <laughs> <laughs> yeah they attack the very small town and the college and they take all the trustees of the college hostage in particular because in the prison one of the people who had been sent there was the child of a, a big media mogul person and so the media mogul donated a bunch of tapes of broadcast television to the prison hoping their kid would learn broadcasting skills while in jail and so they'd seen jason wilder the conservative pundit on tv and so they know if we take that guy hostage we can start making demands we can make this happen for ourselves and so then they're there locking down the college and turning it into what the lead prisoner alton darwin says will be like a black utopia and his own country and will cut down the forest and make money off it. In actuality, the army is about to sweep down on them and knock them out. Yeah, as he says, the violence will be put down by even greater violence soon. Alton Darwin ends up going ice skating on a whim because he just got out of jail. He's never gone ice skating before. This is the guy who up to now was somewhat leading the rebellion or the and he called them freedom fighters and stuff. But he gets shot in the head from very far away by a sniper. And because of the acoustics of the valley, no one knows where it came from. So they know they have enemies in the valley, their leader is dead, now it's fucking chaos. People split up and do whatever they want. And we get a bunch of little stories, not all of which we have time to go into, but like a nice guy finds one of the criminals gut shooting all the horses because he thinks it's funny, yeah. asks him to stop and he shoots him in the head and that's how that guy died. We just get all these stories of like, now it's crazy, shit is crazy. It's like Vietnam, like now it's just chaos and people are trying to escape. Yeah. Um, and one of the crazy things that's happening is the president of Tarkington College, two years ago, if you'll remember, found out that his wife was cheating on him. In the interim, his wife has committed suicide. No, not suicide. Tonight, his wife was captured and raped and killed in front of him by the criminals. Yeah. They're then, very, and they're very brutal in the book. Yes. Right yeah. And he, ha he happens to own a, like a Vietnam sniper rifle as a souvenir. So he climbs to the top of the bell tower and kills as many convicts as he can. He yeah. is a very good sniper, and he kills a lot of people. And that, of course, creates utter chaos. Our <laughs> hero survives because Alton Brown, Alton Brown, Alton Darwin <laughs> had previously ordered him because he's the professor, to go write their new constitution or like think of great ideas that will help build the utopia. He comes up with the idea for freedom fighter beer. We'll start brewing beer. <laughs> and he knows it's not real, but he's like, Alton Darwin will like this idea. <laughs> yeah, I'll stay alive. But that's why he stayed alive, yeah. Yeah, and because he was able to go back and forth between the prisoners and the trustees with ease, everyone thinks, oh, Eugene must have helped the prisoners do this. He must have helped plan the breakout. Right. He's a criminal because he's helped make this happen. Right, the reason he's on trial in the book to begin with is he's blamed for the break out part for basically racist reasons they don't believe the black people could have planned it on their own and he's the only white guy there and the black people weren't killing him so he must be in on it yeah. um, whereas in fact they just didn't kill him because he had always been nice to them yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so he goes he goes back and forth between the two communities sometimes trying to negotiate sometimes just having poignant repartee with jason wilder who's like there what's wrong with this country and he's like well you put them in prison and made things this way and <laughs> you know scenes like that yeah then the convicts find the guy who was sniping them and crucify him yes he gets fucking crucified yep if it wasn't blood meridian enough yet <laughs> Yeah, and it, that brutality escalates. It escalates and then further. Eventually, the army swoops in and locks everything down, and then also... Specifically strangles a dude with piano wire. Yeah. And then says, does anyone else want to not fucking go back to their cells? And everyone goes back to their cells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they, in the process of uh, restoring order, they make Eugene Debs Hardkey the warden of the prison situation, since all the Japanese have left. And then they also turn the college 
into a prison because I think it was all the toilets were destroyed in the In prison. the riot, they destroyed all the toilets. So now the prison is defunct. The college is the prison. Yeah. And he's the warden. Then he quickly gets served with papers saying you're under arrest for masterminding the thing. You are now a prisoner of this prison. Right. So he was a teacher at a college, then a teacher at a prison, then a prisoner at a college. Or it's, yeah, no, then, it, yeah. So he's done every possible interchange of teacher and prisoner in academia and prison. Yeah. Which I, is important to the meat, I think. I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's very intentional that he's lived every permutation of prison, school, and bureaucracy. And he was a soldier in a war that involved the draft. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah, he was kind of all across the the parts of society we want to talk about. Yeah, well, the uh, book's about yeah. prisons, I think, of all kinds. <laughs> yeah, and then from there, that's pretty much the plot. His illegitimate son, Rob Roy, comes through to say hello, and uh, they connect a little bit. Um, and there's actually, I think, more of a connection than Rob Roy expected, and, and Eugene really tries to get one good moment with him and find out about his life. And so maybe that's a hopeful part toward the end. But other than that, he's waiting for his trial. He reveals the riddle of how many people he's killed and adultered with by doing a math equation that we'll talk about in a bit. And then that's the end of the book. There's the art that we mentioned. And, and he gets a letter story. saying that Hiroshi killed himself Yeah, uh, in front of the statue that commemorates where the bomb fell on Hiroshima. Right. And I think it's important to note, because remember... This is a good man, <laughs> and he's committing harikari as a way to show that he's sorry. A young girl who did not know him is the person who finds his disemboweled body, and she's traumatized for life. He just throws that in. That, like, yeah. if you're thinking of killing yourself grotesquely, remember that, like, a little kid might find you. Yeah, or, yeah, someone yes. will. And, yeah. yeah, you can't just do that, and there's no, no ripples. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and there's plenty of blurt to meat to get into as well with this book. Mm -hmm. But I do want to throw it to a segment called Ad Time. Ad Time. Coming. It's the basis of our Ad. capitalist system. Yeah. The segment's no joke. We have a sponsor today. Support for today's show comes from Audible. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. And if you listen to this show, you like books, you read. Uh, I mean, they. I'd like to recommend any of many Vonnegut audiobooks to you. There's one for Breakfast of Champions where John Malkovich is the narrator. He reads you the book, and that's one of the best author, wow. uh, actors around. I've heard pieces of it. It's really, really cool. Also, another book that we would really, really like to recommend is called What the Hell Did I Just Read? It's by the one and only David Wong. There is an audible version narrated by Stephen R. Thorne available right now. You're a fan of David Wong. He's the best. And you can get his book right now off of Audible. You can get a free audiobook, maybe make it that one, with a 30-day trial at www.audible.com slash K-U-R-T-V. That's audible.com slash K-U-R-T-V. Kurt V for a free audiobook with your 30-day trial. All right, what a segment. I know that's new. Hope everybody's all right with it. And let's get into a next segment called Vana Math. Ah, nerds. Plus, plus, in a, minus. In at school, multiple pushing their glasses up on the freaking <laughs> bridge of their nose. <laughs> <laughs> this is a segment I think we've never done before because nope. this book contains a math equation at the end that is the resolution to a riddle that I don't know how much the riddle makes the plot hinge on it, but it's a riddle of how many people has Eugene Debs hard key killed and also separately slept with at the same time or adultered with specifically. I think he leaves off wives. Specifically adultery, yeah. yeah. Well, he says he leaves off wives and prostitutes and he says it as if, well, you know, everyone fucks some prostitutes. Which I ask, <laughs> I'm like, God, this guy sucks. It's the way it goes, yeah. yeah. So he says at the end of the book that he wants to tell people the number, but he's devised the book as a riddle. Only the pe people who have read the whole book can figure out how many people he's killed. So he says, so take the year Eugene Debs died, then subtract the title of the science fiction movie based on a novel by Arthur C. Clarke, which I saw twice in Vietnam, which is so not a very we, hard thing to guess. Are we going to do it? Are we going to do this? Yeah, the let's map? bring it down. Okay, yeah, yeah. so what's... So Eugene Debs dies in 1926. Yeah, that's and, in the dedication. Yeah, and also, yeah, and I guess some of this now is Googleable. Like, it's not really a thing that he was taking into account. Then subtract the title of the science fiction movie based on Arthur C. Clarke novel that he saw twice in Vietnam, which is 2001. All right, so 1926 minus Mad Max Fury Road. Got it. 
That gives us... Minus Barry Lyndon. Batman Great. Begins. No, negative 75. Right. And then what you need to do is add the year of Hitler's birth. Which Where's that? 1912? Is apparently 1889. 1889. Yeah. I'm also... The Vonnegut Encyclopedia by Mark Leeds, it has the whole thing just broken down in it. So I'm kind of working off... I got you. Three. That takes us to 1814. Right. Oh, actually, and he gives you a little checkpoint here. Yeah. He says, if you've done everything right, you'll have the year in which Napoleon was bashed to Elba. And the year the metronome was invented. Neither events in the book, but you can just spot check <laughs> yourself there. 1814, yeah. And it is 1814. That's when he was cool. sent to Elba. Now, add the gestation period of an opossum expressed in days. That is not in the book either, so I make you a gift of it. The number is 12. So add 12. 1826. <laughs> Great. <laughs> then, or he says that number, 1826, is the year in which Thomas Jefferson died and when James Fenimore Cooper published Last of the Mohicans. So there's another checkpoint here. It's pretty ah. easy. Now, Divide by the square root of four, which is two. So divide by two. Nine thirteen. Great. Now, subtract one hundred times nine. So subtract nine hundred. <laughs> Thirteen. Thirteen. Pretty, pretty, pretty chill right now. Now, add the greatest number of children known to have come from the womb of just one woman, and there you are. Sixty-nine. The correct right? answer is sixty-nine. Yes. And then she just laughed and died. Yeah. She's like, that's number 69. <laughs> I did it. She's like, nice. <laughs> that was died. the goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 82. And he says, and there you are. He and then in the book, the picture is a tombstone with a question mark because that's where the number's going to go. Slept with 82 men's wives yep. and killed 82 human beings. Yeah. And then Great. after. Great. Good job, guy. <laughs> you win the book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the whole riddle that we've been building toward. And there's, I don't think, I guess, you know, I've never actually counted it. There might be 82 pictures. It's hard to say. I know I said that would be hard. Before. I think it could be. Let's it do could this. Be I'm good at this. All right. Yeah. I'm looking at the stick figures. You got <laughs> two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. 80, 81, 82. Yeah. There are, there 82? are 82, yeah. Wow. It is accurate. <laughs> it's, oh, wonderful. It's unless great. I'm unless it's off by like one or two because I was counting so fast, but why would yeah. you make it so close and it's not right? <laughs> I should have done that before. Uh, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So the book, uh, is, it really pays <sighs> off, that whole thing. So the we, answer was in the front. So Crazy. we did math and we counted. That's a kind of math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we can go from there to another segment called Kurt Blurt. Oh, finally, Blurt. a Blurt has Blurt. risen to rule them all. <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you. Um, this is the segment where we pick out particularly choice lines and quotes and moments from the book that don't quite fall into a plot summary. I wanted to go to that because after we have that tombstone with a question mark and the riddle, the very last thing in the book is the line, just because some of us can read and write and do a little math, that doesn't mean we deserve to conquer the universe. Of course. And then there's at the end on the drawing, but that's it. Very that's important. One of the line. best. Uh, this book has, to me, it had less blurts than the average Vonnegut, but a lot of huge ones. Like it, it had some really, really key, crucial Vonnegut lines of just all his works. Definitely. Yeah. The two prime movers in the universe are time and luck, for example. Yeah, it's great. Or how is this for a definition of high art? Making the most of the raw materials of futility. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the perpetual motion machines, it's right? Just socking some dingers right there. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually, there's one, because we were talking about how it's written in 2001, and that's kind of funny. Quote, if all had gone the way a lot of people thought it would, Jesus Christ would have been among us again, and the American flag would have been planted on Venus and Mars. No such luck. Yeah. <laughs> when he's talking about what people expected the year of 2000, they expected the millennium would be a huge deal. Or yeah. the millennium, yeah. Yeah, 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 2001, you're right. <laughs> I do think it's interesting that he doesn't swear in the book, and the quote about it is, Profanity and obscenity entitle people who don't want unpleasant information to close their ears and eyes to you. Yeah. Which is true, but I think the opposite is also true, as he points out in, I think, Palm Sunday, where he says the fact that this very classy woman wouldn't think of words like AIDS or gonorrhea meant that she couldn't process those issues. And I don't think it's inconsistency, or I think it's intentional inconsistency. I think that's an example of a Kronos and Classic Infundibulum. Yeah. They're conflicting statements, and they're both true. <laughs> I think they, they do kind of fit together, but it fits together as a fundamental problem about human communication. Yes, like. right. I think when you fit the pieces together, it illuminates yeah. something interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. I hadn't, actually, I hadn't thought of it in, in light of that either. That's a really cool way to put it together. There's a lot of interesting... Well... 
I find I found them somewhat tedious at the time because you're trying to get to the next plot point. But there are interesting history rambles at length. And I just oh, wanted yeah. to point out like a few of them and then encapsulate them with a quote, which is uh, things I didn't know that I learned from this. Well, I did know this, but everyone should know. The assassination of an Austrian archduke, Franz Ferdinand, led to World War I directly and probably to World War II as well. If you need more detail on that, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History has a great series called Blueprint for Armageddon, which it does a great job of blowing your mind with how insanely unlikely it was that World War I and II happened. But they did. Yeah. Like this particular guy had to get assassinated, and he did even though – the assassination attempt failed. The assassin saw him later on a street corner where his car happened to break down and was like, I guess I'll shoot him now then. Hmm. And it, that directly caused World War I and the results of World War I led to World War II, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Stuff we've covered on the site. Hitler was an amphetamine freak, one of the first people on earth to have access to like regular amphetamine pills. Yeah. Towards the end of his reign, he would like chew on carpet glue and shit because his teeth ground. Mm, it's crazy. Oh, I and that. Uh, and I don't even know why this is controversial, which brings me to the quote at the end, that the Nazis, of course, thought they were the good guys. Everyone thinks they're the good guys for most part. Right. So the Nazis had Christian crosses painted on their tanks and armor and helmets and shit. And it's in retrospect that we only depict them with silver skulls and eagles and shit. A lot of them yeah. had Christian iconography painted on the stuff that they were carrying into battle. We just don't like to admit that they thought of themselves as Christian. And in fact, the swastika was supposed to be a Christian cross with the corners turned. And yeah, people are like, yeah. no, don't say that. No, they're <laughs> Nazis. Or even the Iron Cross was just a cross. Like, and the Iron yeah. Cross is their greatest award, and it's not a different cross. They mean the cross Jesus was crucified on. Right. And yet that's so abhorrent to people that you could even compare them in the same breath, Christians and Nazis, that it leads to one of my favorite quotes is, one of the reasons he gets fired, even though he's a teacher, <laughs> is people who are his, who are essentially kings of the school tell him, I don't care if that's true or not. You have no right to tell them that. Yeah. About several of these things. He's like, but that's, I didn't teach them that. It's, I read it in a textbook. It's just true. <laughs> and they're like, even if it's true, a teacher has no right to spread true information yeah. that we find, that the system doesn't like, <laughs> that the system finds unpalatable. Yeah, really. And that's yeah, the quote good, that I like. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. if it's true, you have no right to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> that actually kind of a related one. Uh, he says relatively early, early in the book. The lesson I myself learned over and over again when teaching at the college and then the prison was the uselessness of information to most people except as entertainment. If facts weren't funny or scary or couldn't make you rich, the heck with them. Yeah, similarly, <laughs> what makes so many Americans proud of their ignorance? They act as though their ignorance somehow made them charming, which is well encapsulated in the Sean Baby article you talked about in the most recent episode of the oh, Cracks yeah. podcast. Yeah, yeah. That's the type... That's one of the types of idiots <laughs> is uh, someone who thinks the fact that they're totally ignorant of a subject makes them a maverick outsider who will shake things up in a helpful way. Right. And, and sure, it. you'll shake things up. Most times it won't be helpful. There's rare <laughs> occasions where an outsider's view is like, wow, you really broke the ice and saw it in a new way. Most of the times you're just someone who doesn't know what the fuck they're doing trying to do it. <laughs> Yeah, we all, like we said, we think we're Luke Skywalker. We just need to be the new pilot who is magic, but actually, no, yeah. it's not that. Kind of related to fallacious people. There's a quote, and I tell you, people who are wary of what they might find in a book if they opened one are right to be. Yeah, I had yeah. that one. Very poignant from someone who is so frequently banned. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's, we were talking about the Nazis before. When he's describing Alton Darwin leading the prisoners out of the prison, he sort of draws in comparisons to other people in history. He says of Alton Darwin, he was a sociopath, I think, in love with himself and no one else, craving action for its own sake and indifferent to any long-term consequences. A classic man of destiny. All right, let's do our Alton Darwin stuff. Another line about Alton. He hadn't killed nearly as many people as I had. But then again, he hadn't had my advantage, which was the full cooperation of a government. <laughs> <laughs> And then I think Alton Darwin's final, his arc is actually pretty poignantly beautiful, even though I have deep problems with how all the black convicts are treated as like a monolithic body mm. of crazy people who resort to cannibalism very quickly. Um, yeah. What's well, his deal with eating people? He thinks it's the ultimate thing. Gotta have a cannibal. To throw in, yeah. Yeah. But uh, Alton Darwin, it's great because you just get little snatches of him. He's a supporting character. But in the end, looking back, 
the story that he that you found out is the the basic facts you know of his life are when he was 15 years old he was on his own and he bought a mercedes mm-hmm. he did it by selling drugs he thinks of selling drugs as like selling food to the community they need it they feel better when i give it to them and then they come back and buy more later it's like groceries yeah. he killed several people to protect his territory then he went to jail and he was always haunted by the memory of the fact that his grandfather was in a like a circus sideshow where he would pretend to fly an airplane. Yeah. A white dude would hide underneath and fly it, and people would pay to, quote, see the N-word fly the airplane. Yeah. Like, and what's funny is they weren't even letting him fly the airplane, which, of course, he's capable of. Right. And It's a person, yeah. Right. So then Alton, this guy whose whole life, or at least his life, boiled down in this story, I think, is a metaphor for how we use black bodies for our entertainment solely, and it uses them up. Yeah. He then, in the midst of all this shooting that he knows is dangerous, sees ice skates, and he's never ice skated before. So he tries it, and he realizes he's good at it immediately, and he's, like, super pleased with himself. Then he gets shot in the head, and his last words are, see the N-word, fly the airplane. Yeah. And I just think that's a really poignant thing that he manages in only, like, a dozen lines throughout the book that is, like, a whole person's life being devalued and used for entertainment. Until that all they want is like to be impressive or to like yeah. dance for your amusement. Yeah. Well, no, and kind of like that thing you picked out with Matsumoto's suicide being found by a young girl, like how these hurts can last generations. Absolutely. Like, it, it can right. Like stick with people. The fact that his grandfather was so abjectly humiliated still affects him absolutely in the yeah. present of his life. Yeah. 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 Uh, next one here, this goes back a bit to the cursing. It's uh, a situation where Eugene Debs Harkey had ended a statement with good gravy and everyone was shocked. And he says, in an era as foul mouthed as this one, good gravy had the same power to startle as a cannon shot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, all I have left are really deep, poignant ones. Um, So that I think are Kurt showing through very much. It is unfair to youngsters, particularly, to leave them wholly unprepared for monster screw ups and starring roles in Keystone Cop comedies and such and much, much worse. Uh, oh, yeah. It's the end of a whole speech about how our education system for the large part is based on optimism and it should be based on pessimism. Yeah. Like, like, why do you think it's kind to teach your children, I'm living through this now as a 32-year-old, that all your dreams will come true if you're nice and work hard, when if you're nice and work hard, there's still just a slim chance some of your dreams will come true and thrown in will be a bunch of bullshit at best <laughs> and some major tragedies at worst. Yeah. And, like, we don't teach kids to expect that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually, there, there's a related one, I think, too, because he, off of the, okay, I admitted it really was a whorehouse says that you could expand it to an epitaph for all 20th century working adults. So, you know, like the generation before us. And uh, he says, quote, how could they help themselves when so many of the jobs they or their mates could get had to do with large scale deceptions, legal thefts from public treasuries, or the wrecking of the food chain, the topsoil, the water, or the atmosphere? He's trying to get it like, like those people had it tough too, because they were told like, yeah. well, let's just go out and make refrigerators and build America and do it. And then a lot of the work they found was gross. <laughs> and well, then he, there was a clash between them. I think he points out, because the whole book, we'll get into this a bit, or you'll have to read it, but like humans are germs on the earth is the recurring motif of the book. Yeah. And we live in like a disgusting soup. But I think one of the important points he makes repeatedly is that it's not because we're especially evil. It's just the consequence of the way the universe is, and it's insurmountable. So like he says, all these rich people paid to hide their kids so they wouldn't get drafted to go to Vietnam, whereas me and my buddies died face down in the mud. But if I were rich, wouldn't I pay to have my kid not go to certain death? Yeah. So how can I be mad? And yet at the same time, what they did is despicable. Right. I guess humans are just despicable and that's all there is <laughs> to it. <laughs> um, and he says about Vietnam, quote, I was in show business trying to get a big audience for the government on TV by killing real people with live ammunition, something other advertisers were not free to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> well, there, as far as people being broken in general, this book has one of the one of my favorite Vonnegut lines, period, which is, Another flaw in the human character is that everybody wants to build and nobody wants to do maintenance. Just great. And the following sentences. And the worst flaw is that we're just plain dumb. Admit it. You think Auschwitz was intelligent? I think that's an important point. (laughs) That's true, actually. Let's say Hitler, all the crazy shit Hitler wanted happened. You and I both know 
no amazing society of perfectly functioning like Aryan Brotherhood would arise. Right. A bunch of shit would plug along as it plugs along until people founded reasons to hate each other based on a different difference. And then someone crazy would try and wipe out all the people who are above five, six, because now that's the problem or whatever, you know? Yeah. So like evil is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't accomplish anything also. <laughs> I think a good point. Yeah. Um, and then similarly, he talks about sort of the poisoning of money. Money can be a kind of violence, obviously. And Matsumoto talks about how he thinks they've been trapped. He thinks America has really won another war against Japan, and here's how. You guys bombed us into the Stone Age, then you built all these companies with your wealth, then you invented the stock market, all your money became fake and abstract, then you sold all the real physical companies to us. So now we have to staff them and actually build the shit, and lo and behold, we find out you were fudging the books and blah blah blah, and you gave yourself a golden parachute of five million, and your factory is a falling apart piece of shit. Yeah. So... America shifted all the jobs out and all the responsibility out and kept all the money as an abstract thing and just holds on to it. And there's another character, uh, Dr. Helen Dole in the book, who has an amazing speech that's way too long to quote. But I think one of the most important things she says is, you're not Americans, talking to the richest of the rich, the 1%. Yeah. And he says, I'm born and I live my whole life in America and I'll always be an American. And she says, but like, no, you're not. You've taken your money and your, the, your soul and you've lifted it out of the concerns of the common people. You are no longer a part of the fabric of the country, really. And yeah. we're, I think she says that to Jason yeah. Wilder, too. Uh, to Jason Wilder. Yeah. It's definitely aimed at people who are like, you're not a job creator. You just sold all your factories to a German concern for an obscene profit, and the German concern has come to find that they were ripped off and the factories are shit. You're just moving shit around, lying to people. You're no one. You're like a nation of one by yourself. Yeah, and, and she compares them to colonial powers who came into a place, milked all the money out of it, and then left. Of course. And made it independent, and just it's its own country with nothing now. And she says, like, the rich Americans have done that with all the other Americans. And they've, with the they've responsibility. They've plundered it yeah. and then uh, non-physically left. They've yes. just gone into a rich space. Into a gated community, essentially. Yeah. And also, the, one, of, one of my blurts is because Eugene is describing Jason Wilder in this debate, and Eugene says... On TV, he was always so quick to snatch any idea tossed his way, cover it with spit, so to speak, and throw it back with a crazy spin which made it uncatchable, which is almost all political debate on yes, television, nowadays, especially yeah. conservatives. And so it, that jumped out to him in that moment because Wilder couldn't find a good way to do that with Helen Dole's uh, speech and her, yeah. her belief. And I love that Ed Bergeron, the nicest guy in the room who happens to also be insanely wealthy, is like... I'm not as bad. I had a textile company. I forget what it is, but the gist is I had like a textile company and I couldn't bring myself to use slave labor. So it was going under. So I sold it to a Singapore company who does use slave labor. I'm not using slave labor. <laughs> I just took the profit from selling the company to people I know will use slave labor. <laughs> I'm not as bad. Yeah. And uh, so the narrator says of them, they had managed to convert their wealth into a form so liquid and abstract that there were few reminders coming from anywhere outside that they might be responsible for anyone outside of their own friends and relatives. Yeah. And I think that's definitely something rich people have to look out for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, in the same scene, if I can run on a bit. No, do it. The more they ran on like that, the clearer it became that it was their government, not mine or the convicts or the townies. The first duty of the U.S. government was to protect them from the lower classes, not only in this country, but everywhere. Were people on Easy Street ever any different? Think about the crucifixions of Jesus and the two thieves, or the 6,000 slaves who followed the gladiator Spartacus, cough. And throughout the book, he's written cough whenever he has to cough because he has TB. Yeah, but I think he's dying he's, throughout, yeah. But here he's saying, it's a disease, oh. we're a disease, cough. It's a symptom <laughs> of, like how you would also cough to be like, hint, hint, cough, cough, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because he's like, uh, yeah, rich people in America use the police to kill poor people and oppress them. Did you not know that? We also crucified Jesus because he said we should be nice to poor people. Like, cough, cough. We're right. fucking sick. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I also have two more blurts. I have three um, more. Okay, great. This one is uh, sort of a, a, a positive moment toward the end of it because it, it's a pretty bleak book. And then every once in a while, things work out. And it's at a point where Eugene and the military are trying to kind of piece together what the town's going to be after this break and after this fighting. And they find that 
of all the things, basically everything's been stolen that wasn't tied down, but the fire trucks hadn't had their gasoline stolen yet. And the quote is, every so often in the midst of chaos, you come across an amazing, inexplicable case of civic responsibility. Nice. Which I, it was, because <laughs> you do, I think, like even, the, it's been a, a year and plus of just constant disasters visible on social media. And then things bubble up within them that are just very good Definitely. by individual people. Opposite point. Yeah. <laughs> to me, most want... of the book is the opposite <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> wanting every inhabitable planet to be inhabited is like wanting everybody to have athlete's foot. <laughs> and that importantly ties to the motif where he describes a short story, presumably by Kilgore Trout, although he's not mentioned by name. Yeah. I think we can meet that story. I think okay. We're going to yeah. meet it. All yeah. right. All right. Ward Matsumoto says this about money. And he says that he thinks, you know, they're arguing his friends. And Eugene is like, at least you didn't go through Vietnam. Well, he's not comparing because he has the Hiroshima thing. But I forget how they arrive at it. They're not fighting. But Matsumoto says, but here's what's wrong with money. I'd rather have bodies. All anybody can do with bodies is burn or bury them, and then it's done. There isn't any nightmare afterwards where you are obliged to invest them and make them grow. I think yeah. that's amazing. He yeah. feels like the financial needs and trends of his country and his life are slowly crushing him and he would rather bury a friend because it's over. <laughs> like, it's very weird and interesting to me. Yeah. Oh, I, right. And that like the overall process of being alive and doing the work he has done is not, there's no way to make it like fruitful or good. Right. Because like if you've done something unsavory to get money, what do you do next? Just try and get more money. It's yeah. like you're obliged to keep going if that's what you've made your life about now. Yeah, because you don't build, you just take. Exactly. Right? Yeah. My last one's very connected. It's from Matsumoto, and it's in the process of Eugene realizing Matsumoto commits suicide and then thinking back about him. And he's, Matsumoto is asked why he never left the prison. Matsumoto said, I would only meet more people. And he's asked, well, what do you think of people? And Matsumoto says, I wish I had been born a bird instead. I wish we had all been born birds instead. That's and, as vonnegut as you can get. Yeah, it's like a, a low-key putty wheat. Or with, I would wish I was own... an alligator. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I, lastly, a blurt that I think basically sums up the book if you don't feel like reading it. I think any form of government, not just capitalism, is whatever the people who have all of our money, drunk or sober, sane or insane, do today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I... I must have not pulled it. That one's great. Trump yeah, tweets. Really good. <laughs> yeah, that's when it feels like. Uh, or you wake up every morning and just some crazy shit is happening, and you have to pretend it it's real and like it is real. But I mean, like, <laughs> you have to treat it with gravitas, even when it's something silly like Kafivi, and he claims it's real. Like I meant to yeah. do that. Like now I have to pretend this is real. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, and outside of political leaders too, I feel just like you're rich. <laughs> this is it was written in 1990, which is basically the 80s still, and I feel like it's that thing that's depicted in a movie like Wall Street, where one guy, in order to make money, is manipulating entire companies that people work for, and he's just moving it on a spreadsheet to make money, you know, and then everyone else is just sort of rolling with the punches of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, let's get into, we're going to work toward that, that probably Trout story, but let's get into a segment called Kirk Cameo. Okay. Kirk Cameo. Affirmative. Kirk Cameo. Roger that, buddy. <laughs> this is... Breaker, breaker. We have a Kirk Cameo. <laughs> <laughs> Truckers are watching for mm -hmm. him. This is where we find the literal or uh, generalized cameo by Kurt in the book. He is literally the fake editor of the book. He shows up, and then obviously I think Eugene Debs Hartke is his stand-in in it. And uh, then also, I think there's a real life cameo for him because in real life, Bernard V. O'Hare, who is written in the Slaughterhouse Five and is the close, close war friend of Kurt Vonnegut, he died of cancer and tuberculosis right as this book was being written. So I think when Eugene Debs Hartke in the book has TB and is coughing up blood the entire course mm -hmm. of the book from time to time, it's a grim book that feels like a reference to someone close to Kurt experiencing tuberculosis yes Having although it's implied he'll recover from it he says he's on a medicine that he expects to take care of it and he's not that old oh yeah that's true. eugene yeah. i don't think you're supposed to imagine eugene dies from the tuberculosis i guess Did so you? yeah i sort of wondered if that was false hope on his okay, part maybe 
But it, just but because it the is, protagonist it is explicitly... usually dies at the end of a Vonnegut. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that too. Like, but, why but wouldn't he right. die? <laughs> <laughs> That's how you write a Kurt book. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of characters, let's go right into another segment called Recurring Characters Update. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Recurring characters. They're back. They're back oh, in the book. no. They are great. <laughs> And this one is pretty light on them. Uh, it mostly sticks to the promise that Kurt made in Breakfast at Champions to let people go. The ones it does bring back are also kind of from after that. Paul Slazinger is the writer who is also in Bluebeard. In Bluebeard, he's very run down and a lot like the protagonist, Rabo Karabikian. In this one, he really lucks into a great grant and just gets out of there and, and has a better time of it. Also, the city of Midland City is in this. That's also in Indiana in Breakfast of Champions, Ohio in Dead Eye Dick, and crops up as an Ohio City in Galapagos. And then uh, we mentioned Robo Magic Corporation, which becomes Barrytron, is also in Breakfast of Champions, and that's kind of a go-to, I think, stock corporation that's involved in the military for Vonnegut. And then beyond that, the other main one is an indirect, not named, but probably in there, Kilgore Trout. There's one long, long story called The Protocols of the Elders of Trif Elf Amador. It's not a long story, but it's the one key piece of science fiction writing that's in a piece of pornography that is in this book, and obviously Trout's in a whole bunch of other Vonnegut books. He'll also be the main character in the next novel. We have some other books in between, but the novel Time Quake that's coming up, he's the main character in that. And he's often printed in porn without his name, so it's yeah. easy to believe that it's Trout. Also, uh, Damon Stern's wife, who does nothing and is only mentioned once, is named Wanda June. Yeah. German land speculators end up owning most of the valley. I have to assume they're the same ones from the end of Bluebeard. Oh, yeah. Um, he moons over a picture of a marine iguana digesting seaweed on the Galapagos Islands. <laughs> Ed Bergeron's last name is Bergeron. Yeah. Mark Rothko's in hinty. it. It's Yeah. Uh, and then last but not least, I do think the repeated phrase that he says every time a character's death is mentioned, they were buried or they weren't buried in the shadow of Musket Mountain when the sun goes down. Is the I think that's his so it goes. I think he picked the long one this time. Yeah. But I think true, that yeah. harkens back to Slaughterhouse Five just in a technique way where he did I mark every death with a repeated chant. It's that's just true. a different set of words this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it yeah, it is th this book weirdly, it had a lot of like Easter eggy connections to his other yes. books. I think almost Slot. every book of his comes up in an Easter eggy way that doesn't always feel motivated by anything even he just like wanted to work in a lady named wanda june like yeah. ah remember you know uh, but other times it does really connect very uh, strongly and speaking of let's get into another segment called the meat choppity chop finally choppity chop choppity chop choppity chop <laughs> this is the segment where we get into big themes and ideas that we haven't gotten into yet and there is a, there's a magazine that Jack Patton has called Black Garter Belt, and it has an unauthor credited story about the protocols of the elders of Tralfamador, and it's a sci-fi story about the Tralfamadorian aliens, so another recurring character there, too. Um, again, trying... they are described completely differently. Yeah, also different so again. So they've been yeah. different twice. This time they are like uh, strings of energy thousands of miles long. Right, yeah, instead of organic life or robotic life right. or something. And they want to spread life through the universe. And they, uh, the gist of the story is they realize that Earth is building crazy enough germs because of all of our pollution and nuking each other and being cruel to each other. The Earth is building crazy enough germs that really can spread through the universe and make it happen. Other life is too squishy and weak, but germs go through such horrible shit on this planet that they can really do it. And so Earth is becoming how Tralfamador is spreading life. Yes, they want life to spread for unknown reasons, but the ironic twist is simply that all of Earth is a Petri dish to toughen up germs, and yeah. germs are truly God's chosen. Germs are the ones that will eventually spread into the universe and colonize all space. Because why wouldn't they? We require so much resource input, yeah. and they just hibernate and get hit by an asteroid in 10,000 years and then wake up on another planet. So germs are the chosen people, not us. We are germ hotels <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess the the meat of that is like does vonnegut truly feel that way about people because i think he also feels we're stupid assholes in addition to not as tough as germs and capable it's like it's a pretty well it's a pretty nihilistic book as as his go i think i'd go the negative way and say that i don't think he thinks germs are great 
Oh, yeah. I'd yeah, say sure. you think germs yeah. are dumb assholes, too. They're just more <laughs> suited to survivability in space. Yeah. Yeah. I To me, the whole book was literally about prisons and enslavement. And, like, prison is a prison. That's your tip-off of what to look for. But the school is a prison. The class system is a prison. Their bodies are prisons. That's why I think there's a lot of characters with disabilities and illnesses. Your body is a prison. You're born yeah. into a prison. Um, one of the black convicts says, Lord, I was born in a uniform. I don't need a uniform. My blackness tells people that they yeah. can treat me with disrespect. And, and, and they use a recurring thing of black people being described as color-coded. Yes. Like society uh, color-coded. Exactly. Uh, your skin be. color is a prison. The limitations of your own mind are shown to be a prison in it. Bureaucracy is a prison because it fucks him unjustly for no reason. Chaos is a prison is something I never occurred to me before I read this because the very fact that tiny changes on the other side of the world could affect your fate and vice versa and you never know who's the Sam Wakefield in my life, that's a prison. That removes from you the ability to make choices. When you say chaos, do you mean like that description of chaos theory where a butterfly across the world starts weather? Yes, or in the fact that Sam Wakefield said, are you in a hurry, son? You should join West Point. At that moment, an angel didn't swoop down and say, this is a very important decision, like in a video game. Do you, A, want to become a soldier, or B, (laughs) want to become a journalist? He didn't know that he was making such a weighty decision. And the very fact that our lives are unpredictable imprisons us in a way because you are not dictating what happens. Yeah. And you want to be, but you're not. (laughs) Vietnam was a prison for him, obviously. He depicts the inner cities as prisons. He depicts fate as a prison because for no reason he introduces this machine called Griot that you plug in your info and it tells you what's going to happen to you. I I read it as Griot. Griot. Of course he fucking did. (laughs) I think because I think it's a thing. I think it's like a West African storyteller. Oh, okay. But the point is. If you plug in all your info and it says you're going to die homeless in a gutter, you die homeless in a gutter. Like, you can't. It's unlikely that you'll change it. Yeah. It's a, like predicting the lives of people based on some inputs. And he like he uses it to just check in with himself, too. Like, he in particular decides that the Tarkington College job saved his life because yeah. he ran himself. And Marilyn Shaw, who was another veteran who got a job at Tarkington, he he runs the two of them through it. And they both end up, like, dead and alcoholic. And I, I guess I yeah. guess dead is worse than alcoholic. I don't know why I ordered it that way. But. In for- Information is a prison because he teaches the prisoners how to read and then he is very upset that the most popular material to read in the prison becomes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a Nazi tract explaining how the Jews control the world. Like yeah. it's it's evil propaganda. So like even something as good as teaching an illiterate to read, they're now imprisoned by whatever thoughts they have access to. Which he point that's why they have very old tapes because he says they're allowed to experience absolutely anything in the range of human experience as long as it's irrelevant. Yeah. The punishment actually... of going to prison is actually we're going to make your life have no consequence to anyone. That's your punishment. One of my one of my favorite jokes in it. It wasn't quite a blurt on its mm-hmm. own, but he's talking about the prisoners reacting to oh now. Now I can read anti-Semitic tracts and then he's saying what else they've gained yeah. from what he wrote. And the last line is, one man told me that literacy made it a lot more fun for him to masturbate. Right. They're not allowed to have <laughs> porn, but now he has porn he can read. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, oh, great. Cool. And then uh, last but not least, I think going down to the base level that I think the aside about the castle that Arthur K. Clarke let fly is meant yeah. to show that. I don't Even, know if we described him either. We didn't. It doesn't matter. Okay. They should yeah. read it. You can't get every detail. <laughs> this one's really packed. This and, one's and also long very long. Too. Yeah, very it's long. a long one. Yeah. <laughs> but who knew it was so complicated, Hocus Pocus. <laughs> but yeah, there's a point at which, I'm not going to explain why, a bouncy castle is inflated with helium and is taken by the wind and blows up into the sky. And the prisoners who can only see through a tiny window who happen to be looking out the window at that time started reporting to the prison psychologist that there's floating castles outside. And... The fact that they assume that because they're only allowed to see through a tiny window, I think is an obvious symbol about your perception as a prison and the main way we oppress people is by controlling their perceptions That's or limiting cool their perceptions. Yeah. Cause, well, because also I think it's very easy to come away from this book and take it mainly as a reading of criticism of society in particular because I don't know how bad these problems were in 1990, but both the problems of everything about how our prisons work and overpopulation and them being for profit and too many people being in them is a huge problem now. And also the price of college is a huge problem Mm now to the point where in some ways I think it reinforces class divisions. And so it's very easy to take those two structures being across from each other and invading each other as being the whole point of it. But 
but that more fundamental reading you you pulled out of just everything being imprisonment is amazing. Well, it's in there. I mean, yeah, yeah the layers are in there. And that's what we mean yeah. by like, yeah, it's worth reading because it's packed all the way down to like, everything's a prison and your mind's a prison and your skin and germs. You're a prison to them yeah. from top to bottom. It's just a prison. <laughs> it's quite, it really makes the universe feel awful. <laughs> <laughs> Effectively. Yeah. I think especially when we mentioned that there's sort of Easter eggs of all the books, I feel like this one has so many layers to it that you could almost sit down and make an argument for this being a, an extension of every individual other Vonnegut book. You could say it like this mm. is a Vietnamized, more of in the future version of Mother Night. You could say this is a an extension of the breakfast verse because you've got Midland City in there and also because it's about society being broken and racism being intrinsic to it. And uh, you could, I think, pull out almost every Vonnegut book from this one. I agree. I don't think yeah. there's something, any topic he's covered before that wasn't touched on. <laughs> it's yeah. It's a real panoply. Yeah, it's really, it's really ranging through all of it. Yeah. But it's, it's also not quite Breakfast of Champions, where Breakfast of Champions pulls together all his previous work in such a direct way. Like the characters are showing up and it's very obvious and really decided exactly what's in here. I think this one doesn't quite pull it off as well. It's just something more where as a reader, you could be like, oh, all the Vonnegut things are happening again. Yeah, they're all here. But yeah, what a what a what a sweet, sweet pile of meat. Let's get into <laughs> another segment called Vana What? Right from what we like to Vana what? what we don't like. Vana what? <laughs> This is a segment, if you haven't heard the show, where we pick out things that may be offensive or problematic or just weird issues that are worth mentioning about the book. Yeah, and I usually go real hard in this section. <laughs> I'm going to ease off a little because I do think he did way more work to show, to prove to me that it wasn't unexamined biases. They were yeah. thing, topics he was actually tackling. Like, I think it's another Breakfast of Champions parallel here because like in Breakfast of Champions, there's a lot of gross things that I think are thought through. You of know? course, it's important and despicable that the main character finds it easy sometimes to kill people, calls the students who are dement developmentally disabled stupid, yeah. and says my mother was fat enough to be a circus freak, I hated her, and wants to defenestrate that girl, Kimberly, it like can contemplates throwing her out of a window to her death, and constantly parses skin color and is aware of everyone's skin color and will uh, say like, this dude was black, but like he could have passed for white. But... That's clearly the character's problem. It's not in the narration. It's in the character's voice. And it's, yeah, and it's the point. Yeah. So see, I see the difference. There have been people out there who are like, you don't understand between what he's doing and what he's not doing. And I think I do. Like this <laughs> one, I think he meant it. In the other ones, I think he was being problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there there is also something here where, and it's sort of a Bechdel test type problem. This isn't, that's not an exact thing, but Every woman in the book is either someone used for adultery or a close uh, wife or relative of his who goes insane or a developmentally challenged student. Like there, there's yes. basically no women who aren't literally sex objects that the main character has sex with. Or Which is also a problem of his, though, I think. And that's a thing that happens with him throughout. Like, he refers to women and their <laughs> wombs as booby traps, and then later in the book says, I realized that I referred to women as mere machinery, and that's despicable. So, like, I do think he gave us more clues that, yeah, this, maybe. that he, Vonnegut, knows that this guy is a dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why when I say the Bechdel test, I think it's almost more of a problem that just he still isn't writing any books around women. That's true. Like, when you, in, on Bluebeard, you really brilliantly picked out that he probably probably could have made Marilee Kemp the main character mm -hmm. and had a, a book with a female protagonist. That was brilliant. But instead he... <laughs> really? Uh, but instead he he is just... Uh, he's making his main character plow through them. I guess I'll just yeah. put it that way. <laughs> Equates <laughs> adultery to food in the way that he's... In the same way that Alton Darwin equated drugs to food. Yeah. Alton Darwin says, like, people eat food and they eat drugs. What, what am I doing wrong? He says... People are happy and full after they eat food and after I fuck them. So what's wrong with me fucking them? Only later to have the women go, well, but you said you were in love with me and you wanted to like move to Venice and run away from my husband. He's like, yeah, to make the fucking more romantic. And they're like, well, that's fucked up. Yeah. Don't you understand that people take things you say as what they say? <laughs> that as is what they mean. <laughs> it is actually, it's not a Vanua, but I, I like how he makes the main character even more of an asshole when Rob Roy comes along as an mm -hmm. illegitimate son and has a meeting with him. And throughout the book, 
Eugene's kind of implied that his hookup with the Des Moines reporter in Manila was like, that was just a positive time for us. What a good thing. And then Rob Roy has all kinds of questions for Eugene based on massive lies Eugene told her yes. to get her into bed. Oh, yeah. Huge he lies, lies elaborately and easily. <laughs> Yeah, that's he's like, and you still have that beloved uh, baseball glove that your friend gave to you as he died in the mud, and he's like, yeah. "What? What glove? I mean, uh, yeah, oh, I must have told your dead mom that." <laughs> um, well, he doesn't even admit. That. No, I know. Yeah, 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 he doesn't admit it, but in his head. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, okay. Let's one, keep bagging on the one, pro tag. One first. more, one more women thing. Also, yeah, he yeah, yeah. takes the time early on to say that Eugene says his mother was fat enough to be a circus freak, mm. and Vonnegut's just like still fixated on yes. ladies gaining weight. It's really, I wish he wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, he also says of a woman, uh, I made a pass at her, and she said no. It later turned out years later she was a lesbian. I knew she was a lesbian before she did. Why? Because she didn't immediately sleep with you, you 55-year-old <laughs> college professor? Fuck off. Yeah. Like, I hate, like, oh, she must be a lesbian because she didn't sleep with me. <laughs> um, but that's his problem. Now on to Vonnegut's actual problems. Yeah. <laughs> Things that I think are really problematic. He's acutely aware of the plight of the black American and seems to have a lot of uh, sympathy for and understanding of the mechanics that oppress black Americans. Yeah. At the same time, he makes all the criminals pretty much monolithically sociopaths who, as I said, execute hostages, eat dead horse, and end up killing and eating some of their own number. Yeah. Uh, in a short, in like they're under siege for five days. They don't run the siege well. They're all dumb and disorganized. I just think it was very unfair, even more than it had to be, uh, and I'll give examples that I think point at that so you people can't just say, you're just saying that and he didn't mean it, right? But he says stuff like, um, he says of a moment where he feels pleasure, I had the same undeserved happiness so many of the convicts found in chemicals. And he paints it as bad that they do drugs. Like when they break out of prison, he says, of course I think it was terrible they broke out of prison. Their drug-addled brains can't do anything right. Which I'm like, all right, that's like what Trump says about the inner city. <laughs> Only insofar as... There's another long section where he says, in Vietnam, everyone used drugs. I think it's totally acceptable. When you're doing some shit as crazy as Vietnam, you need some drugs to get by. I don't blame myself for using drugs. Then he sees a bunch of black people doing drugs and goes, that's why they're crazy, probably because of all the drugs they do. Yeah. That's a real double standard that's embedded in the story's structure, not called out at all. Yeah, and it only it only kind of plays as being the character's perspective. Right. Yeah. And he also points out, you know, black people aren't the only people who do cannibalism. The Donner Party are a bunch of white people who did cannibalism. The difference being you're depicting a group of people who ate each other after weeks of frostbite and being stuck compared to a group of people that you're saying immediately decided on the strategy of let's eat some people. I just <laughs> don't think it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I have one other... <laughs> main what which is the overall too. approach to aids is just kind of foul uh, uh he inter when he introduces alton darwin alton does jokes and descriptions of the prisoners giving each other aids and they describe it as pb which is short for parole board which is a way of they're basically deciding to commit suicide via aids and, and I believe once the disease becomes advanced, you get moved to a hospital instead of a prison. So yeah. it's, you're paroled in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I maybe it's realistic in a way that's OK, <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it it's is. Awful, but, and either yeah. either way, it felt unearned as a thing to throw into your book, especially if it's written when the AIDS crisis is right. like blooming in the country. And he chooses to make our economic catastrophe the work of his word, Orientals. Yeah. And he routinely, the narrator, lumps them together like he'll go, the Japanese came over, so of course when I was in China, I did this. And then I was worried because I was talking to a Vietnamese guy and he's and I'm like, what if he knows I killed some Japanese people? It's like, uh, he's Vietnamese, not Japanese. Yeah. They're Chinese, not Japanese. It's like, <laughs> he, he does that classic thing where we're still much uh, more okay in America with assuming all Asians are a giant monolith than black Americans. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And white Americans are then very, very individualized. He interchangeably like, I'm mixes... I'm Scotch-Irish. Right. Or like... <laughs> but he'll interchangeably mix up Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, and Vietnamese all throughout the book. Yeah. And that, it's, that sucks. Yeah, it sucks. Um, and similarly, he'll say, there we were in a Chinese restaurant with everyone dangling who knows what from their chopsticks. We know what? Orange chicken, rice noodles. Like, you don't have to make it. Um, <laughs> similarly, he says, the Mexicans in the prison. This is just funny to me because it's like a grandpa thing to say. The Mexicans have a favorite dish I had never tried. They call it twice fried beans. 
Yeah, that oh, was yeah? weird. You want some twice fried beans with your taco, Grandpa? It's fucking <laughs> refried beans, dude. They're refried. <laughs> yeah, that was, he was just deeply unfamiliar with Mexican food. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Just doesn't get it. <laughs> and then last but not least, I think in a similar way that it's buried in the structure and that makes it problematic, I just think it's interesting that in the whole canon of Vonnegut we've read, there's two flamboyantly gay son characters. Mm. One is Bunny Hoover. Bunny Hoover grows up with a dad who hates that he's gay, is ashamed of being gay, largely hides it from the community until later in life, and has, like, a respectable job out of sight of everyone, and is not happy but lives a full life. Yeah. The gay son in this book, who's mentioned in passing, is the son of a guy who's fine with the fact that he's gay, yeah. so he's more comfortable being flamboyant which in Vonnegut's mind makes him become a figure skater, which is like the most stereotypical possible <laughs> gay job to give him. Yeah. And then he gets strangled to death with a belt and stabbed a hundred times in the chest in what is clearly a homophobic hate crime. Yeah. Is Vonnegut saying, hey, gays, stay in the closet. It's too dangerous out there. I, I just so. have a problem with those two things both existing. And it seems like a goofus and gallant thing where it's like, Bunny lived because he didn't rub it in people's faces. This guy did and look what happened, you know? Oh, I actually, I took it as just trying to spell out how cruel and brutal society is. Like, and maybe it's another prison theme well, Hopefully too. it's just that, yeah. Like, like <laughs> well, it's sort of a prison theme too where like Bunny stayed in prison and was not killed outside the jail. Well, and also the gay son and his father, their last name is Bergeron, which is another random like And he Easter became a egg. beautiful dancer and society crushed him for it, right? Oh, I'm, I'm just picking out the last name Bergeron is like a Harrison Bergeron. Easter oh, I know, but the Bergeron yeah, son is the gay yeah. son, right? Yeah, he is. Yeah, so I'm book. saying yeah, it's, yeah. it's, he totally is Harrison Bergeron. He allows he himself to become name. his true, his name is not Harrison, yeah. but I mean symbolically. Oh, yeah. He allows himself to become his truest self and society is like, that's unacceptable, we kill you. Yeah, that's true. I mean, he lives out Harrison Bergeron, basically. Yeah. In so like, it's more, I don't, so I don't think Vonnegut's like recommending that gay people need no, to do that. No, he's just, just describing like, how fucking yeah. scary and dangerous it was to come out of the closet at that time. I'll buy that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because that also, especially, yeah, that was early 90s. That was a real critical time for yes. all of that. Yeah. There is, there's one extra. Somebody tweeted this to me. I forget who. But apparently the phrase hocus pocus is like a relatively obscure slur against Catholics. It's how ah. it's based on a verse of Latin that Protestants would use like around Reformation times to make fun Calling of Catholics. Calling Catholics for... like this shit you say is just nonsense, magic, gobbledygook. Yeah. Okay. So this is probably our first book where the title is a potential Vanawat. I, I grew up mostly Catholic and I've never heard of that. So that might just be a, a very obscure thing. But he but... uses it in the same way. Like yeah. in the book, he uses it. He uses Hocus Pocus to describe the kind of spiel he would give that would trick a 17-year-old into committing suicide by joining the army. Yeah. That's Hocus Pocus. So it's you, you being used the same, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, the kind of bullshit so you over. say to get these peasants to give you all their gold because you're the Catholic Church. Hocus Pocus. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's how they use it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's very Martin Luther. Like, no. But yeah, I think those are all the Vana Watts, right? That's what we got? Definitely. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, get into it. Let's move into a segment called Kurt Vana Grades. You're in school Favorite now, bitches. Vana at school. Unsaved by the bell. <laughs> Woke up late in the morning and my alarm, it didn't go off. And I think <laughs> that I'm fucked right now. <laughs> like a show where you just slept through everything. <laughs> right. He's just it's a, all and... fucked because I slept through my phone. <laughs> <laughs> just like one shot of a guy still sleeping at yeah. noon. Yeah. Uh, the main character, Max Zorris's power is that he can freeze time and then it stays frozen forever and he could never unfreeze it. <laughs> Horrible show. We should just go make this Very show. Very depressing show. Sounds great. This is uh, Kurt Vada Grades. It's a segment where we grade the book. We're bouncing off of a time in Palm Sunday where Kurt graded himself relative to himself. We are now a couple of books into there being no more grades from Kurt for the books. Michael, where'd you fall on this book? As far as a grade goes. A solid B. I did too. Oh, great. Exactly. And I, it could have been slightly higher maybe if I had had a more leisurely time to read it. It was longer than the Vonnegut books. Not that it's immensely long, but I gave myself the same amount of time. So I rushed through it a bit. Mm. And there's so much horrible shit. Yeah. Like if you watched Requiem for a Dream on double speed, at the end you might be like, I had a keen, I don't know if I liked it. It was pretty unpleasant. <laughs> so like it was very unpleasant. And it took me like half an hour to breathe and be like, okay, but was it good? And did you learn a lot? 
Yes, solid B. <laughs> yeah, and I learned a lot I didn't know before. Whereas in Bluebeard, I did feel that there was a lot of wisdom, but it was all basic shit I already knew. That's why I realized I don't like it that much. <laughs> That's interesting. Because, I well, Bluebeard I read for the first time for this show. Mm -hmm. Hocus Pocus I had read as a kid, or at, at teen, I guess. And I think I remember it hitting me really hard as a teen. And I think it's partly because a lot of the history was new and a lot of the facts in it were new. And so now going through it this time, it felt heavier without as much surprise you know and it also having read it after we've read all the previous books leading up to it i feel like like we said he's so in control of his craft it's delightfully easter egg -y. there's there's so many great moments so many great lines so much great use of art it also feels like all of his books kind of in a blender it's crazy i went like oh it's just mother night but with this protagonist and then later i went no it's not it's slaughterhouse five but with a different war yeah. no it's not it's cat's cradle but set it and so on like yeah yeah it inhabits almost every kind of book he's written yeah yeah and so it's like it's a super solid novel that i don't love it's just like good it's a, another good episode of Vonnegut. To the you know? bees! <laughs> bees! Yeah. May they multiply and pollinate our flowers for decades to come. <laughs> what I, and also, I partly think it really is uh, kind of digesting all his books into one thing because his next attempt at a novel will eventually become Timequake, which is kind of an autobiographical story of trying to write a novel, too. Like, it's sort of an attempt at that. And then that's it as far as straightforward novels for him. And I feel like maybe with this one, he... he didn't hit a wall doing it, but like once he did it, he thought, oh no, what do I do that is not a repeat of my other stuff and Hocus Pocus, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like I I, I've really, I've really explored I, the Vonnegut although, novel process. I don't, if I have read Timequake, and if I recall, it's fairly unique. It, yeah. ha it has a broken down old man freezing in Manhattan because he can't think of what to do next. But other than that, there's not a ton of Vonnegut -y. Well, it'll, it'll. I thought it was refreshing, like, it, and and really impressive that so late in yeah. his career he came out with a book that did depart. Timequake well, feels like a departure. It it does, yeah. And he did he did get there. It took Timequake doesn't come out until 1997, so seven years after this, and he did have to write it one whole way and then write it a whole nother way that was more metafictional because there's the clam bake with all his past characters yeah. and people in his real life and sort of the the fourth wall is really really wavy and it's the most ever it's awesome yeah so it's it's amazing but i feel like this one he was like i did it as far as standard kurt vonnegut novels like i i've completed that yeah as a thing yeah if you appreciate him as a writer beyond like the fact that the things he says are wise and smart and funny, you shouldn't miss this one. It's yeah. the most impressive piece of writing structure wise, I think. Yeah, it's really well put together. Yeah. And and like I said, there's a lot of just historical facts in it that we didn't get to because they're just interesting and, and yeah. play really thematically well within the book. So and just you'll get his, to see those. His yeah. amazing confidence to be like, now I'm going to cover five years in two pages. Now I'm going to cover 10 minutes in 40 pages. Yeah. And you're like, how did you know that that was the right thing to do? How did you know that would work out? He's just so confident in this one. Yeah, really. Oh, it's great. Uh, but right, I agree. On, I agree on the great. <laughs> but still a B because still there's B. just some that that because of the content or the particular topic or whatever like moved my heart in a way that I can't even define. Yeah, same. like sirens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, a, a bunch of the ones it reminded yeah. me of too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Speaking of other books, let's get into a segment called Related Reading. Hell yeah, hell oh, to the yeah, because you're gonna read to a be book be and it's gonna be fine. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> that worked out. This is a segment bow, where bow, bow, bow. <laughs> this is a segment where we pull out other works and books that remind us of what we just uh, read and enjoyed, and you think we think you might enjoy it too. I have two for this one. I have two things. I got three, sir. Oh, great! Why don't so you go I'll first? go first. Yeah. Okay. This is a very light one. It's a three-minute song, easy to knock out, but it might introduce you to a rapper you might like. MC Frontalot, Godfather of Nerdcore Hip Hop. Yeah. Are you familiar? He has a song called 80,085, which if you're familiar with, a calculator spells boobs. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, like the end of this book. <laughs> it's a word puzzle that you play along with the song with your calculator. And if you do all the math right, it ends with boobs. Holy cow. But the entire three minute, three verse song is continuously like you got to like pause it and be like, okay, wait, what did he say? An eighth of the receptionist took x rays of all the people whose foot, left foot was broken. How many was that? And it's just like a super fun thing that I've never heard or seen before or since. Combination rap and riddle and game. <laughs> it's wow. very fun. Yeah. 
Oh, it's amazing. It's called 80085 by MC Frontalot. Oops. From the album Zero Day, which is one of his best albums. I recommend the whole album. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I, I have an extra one if you, if you don't bring it in. I thought we were going to do uh, the song Hocus Pocus by the band Focus. No, that was homework from last up. week. You're yeah. not allowed to hear this voice talking right now if you haven't oh, yeah. listened to Hocus Pocus by Focus. And, also, and my brother picked out a video of them doing it live. Even better. It's great. Ooh, can we post that on the it's episode like page? Level. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. put it up. Yeah. We'll link to a live rendition of Hocus Pocus. <laughs> really good. And it also, it just has uh, some of the songs that people bring in as, oh, this relates to a Vonnegut book. I'm like, I don't know. They kind of mention it. That song feels like like the soundtrack to this book. Like, yeah. I could I could see flying through Vietnam to that song or running through a prison break or yeah. like it's very intense and a little bit uh, uh, chaotic in a yeah. way that fits. Yeah. All right. My second one is a movie. I will Ooh. end with a written thing. <laughs> oh. Brazil. Brazil. Terry oh, Gilliam. That's a great uh, pick. A classic. Yeah. Phenomenal. Definitely watch the director's cut with the depressing ending, not the studio cut that was released with the happy ending that they tacked on that ruins the whole fucking movie. Mm. So fair warning if you haven't seen it, this is one of the times where it actually matters. Watch the director's cut. Like literally don't watch it unless you have the director's cut in your possession. <laughs> but... It's a lot like Franz Kafka's The Trial. It's basically, you know, this book reminded me a hocus pocus, a lot of like, I did something bad. Well, then you're fucked. Okay, then I did something good. Well, you're still fucked. Okay, then I did something good again. Well, now here's a reward. Okay, then I did something good again. Well, now you're fucked. Okay, then I'm going to do something bad. Well, here's a reward. Well, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand what to do with my life. And that's the feeling you get from a lot of Kafka, but also the best movie I've ever seen about that feeling is Brazil. Uh, yeah. It's just a future where a dude lives in a state that is so bureaucratized that a single typo that a clerical error uh, at some building downtown completely unravels and ruins his life. Yeah. And there's nothing he can do. And there's nothing anyone could have done. The system is unbeatable. <laughs> 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 and it's really scary. But bureaucracy is a villain. It's one of Robert Amazing De Niro's movie. first roles. Super fun. Yeah. Jonathan Price is great in it. And yeah. just ev everything about it is distinctive. It's really yes. cool. I'll do it because I, I have a book and I have a visual thing. The visual thing is Ken Burns, The Vietnam War which I am most of the way through, not all the way. But for one thing, it was pointed out in a review of it that the very beginning of the documentary is going through the whole war in reverse. Like there's a lot of just rewound shots. So then planes, bombs are coming back up into them. And oh. things. So it's got a Slaughterhouse Five vibe yeah. with that going on. But it also so far is a really excellent, just, I mean, Ken Burns doesn't make bad documentaries. And it also, it has a soundtrack by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. So instead of that thing you expect from like Ken Burns' The Civil War, where it's yeah. Appalachian violin, it's a lot of like... It's like intense it's and a dark. Mix of, <laughs> it's a mix of the standard things we soundtrack Vietnam with, with like Bob Dylan, right. and then really intense, dark, harrowing music. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And they wow. speak they speak to people on both sides too like they find right. a lot of old North Vietnamese soldiers and it's really cool. Yeah, my stepdad was watching that the whole day I was reading this downstairs trying to finish for this podcast. Yeah. Oh, he was yeah. getting through the documentary. I actually yeah. I was prepping this called my dad and he was like, I've been watching this documentary. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Long required viewing. All yeah. right, my last one is the play The Children's Hour by Lillian Hellman uh huh. which is the piece of assigned reading that I had that upset me viscerally the most of any. It is a story about two women who run a boarding school for girls, and some of the girls are just brats and don't, or possible sociopaths, don't understand or care about consequences of your actions on other people yet. I mean, they're very young. Yeah. Um, and... Basically, the women either are lesbian lovers or it's just rumored. It's left vague. But it spirals into the girls accusing them of child molestation and just these scenes where it's it becomes a horror thing and it twists your guts. It's awesome. Cool. Like scenes where the woman's like begging a kid, you know, like you don't understand because you're eight. You Okay, honey, like you need to – you're ruining my whole life, okay? Wow. And the kid's like, I know. And she's like, you have to tell them it's a lie. And she's like, no. And you're like, I want to strangle this kid. Yeah. It's, it's really chilling and awesome. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And have you ever seen it performed or just read it? I just looked it up online before we recorded and found out there's a movie version oh. that, let me peek at the cast because I remember thinking, wow, I really want to see that now. Oh, Shirley MacLaine was great. in the movie. Great, great. And yeah, it sounds 
Like it could be real good. So yeah, there's a movie version. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, and Audrey Hepburn and James Garner. So pff, it's probably great. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Probably, it's probably amazing. Well, great. My last one is a novel. It's called Candide. It's by Voltaire. It's my favorite novel, probably behind Sirens. Yeah. Oh, really? Or, oh, great. Uh, yeah, it's I really good. It's it's the book of philosophy. I think is the most correct. Yeah, it's a uh, and it ties into this one quite a bit in particular for that philosophy. I think because it's it's a story of one guy being sort of it's a road journey through uh whether the world is a good place or not and they argue about that and it's about the perceived wisdom that the world is a good place and how it, it probably isn't true but we all must cultivate our garden and there's also a lot of sort of historical moments in it that we don't even know about today like nobody thinks about an earthquake that happened in lisbon portugal <laughs> and it's crucial um but there's a lot of that there's also a lot of disease being a key thing in it it's a really amazingly fast and funny work for being written hundreds of years ago. I am going to get hate and I am ready for it. But if I reach someone and this means something to them, I need to say it because people should read it if they haven't. Changed my life. It's shorter, clearer, more correct and kinder than the Bible. Just read it instead of the Bible. <laughs> and whereas I say, oh, Sirens is my Bible of novels, I really just mean it's my favorite novel and I'm using hyperbole. I really mean I prefer this was the center of a religion over the Christian Bible. Yeah. It's much clearer and, and nicer and makes more sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's shorter. It's Yeah, it's short. Yeah. But well, uh, I guess the Bible's a good parallel in the sense that there's a lot of antique things in both books. And you, you have to push through a little bit of that to just get the meaning. But it's doable. It's not hard. Yeah. Whew, I can feel those tweets coming in. <laughs> That's I, The room is filling with tweets. It's going to be fun to see what people say about I'm that. Drowning. I'm we drowning. We have seconds. <laughs> uh, well, great. Uh, speaking of uh, updates, I guess. That's yeah. what I think of Twitter as. Let's do uh, one more segment here called Vonnegut News. Retweet Vonnegut this news, news on your Twitter. Because tweet is the thing that you just can't beat her. <laughs> This is, uh, as far as what's happening in the world of Kurt in early October 2017, there's a massive collection of Kurt Vonnegut's short stories. It's called Complete Stories because it's all of them, and it includes five previously unpublished short stories. Um, three of them were recently shit. printed hot online. Shit. Ooh, hot <laughs> off the press. One was printed in The Atlantic, one was printed in Mother Jones, one was printed on the Powell's Books blog, but they're all in this collection <laughs> along with... All of his other short stories all in one place, which I don't think has existed yet. And it was compiled by um, Jerome Klinkowitz and Dan Wakefield, who are Vonnegut experts and know what they're doing. Vonnegut. Yeah. So that's that's out there for you Vonnegut fans. You can go read it. Amazing. Yeah. And other than that, I think we've completed Hocus Pocus, which right. is uh, pretty neat. What's up next, Chief? Our next episode is going to be about Fates Worse Than Death, written in 1991. It's an autobiographical collage. Oh, good. An life. upbeat one from this one. Great. <laughs> And uh, it's just pictures like being boiled alive. That's worse than death. Like, uh, <laughs> getting your skin slowly removed. Eh? Worse than death, huh? Eh? He's losing it. Vonnegut's <laughs> losing his touch. <laughs> it's just like a faces of death thing. Like, yeah. It's just it's horrible. The guy like stabs you a lot, but you don't die. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Comes back tomorrow, stabs you more. <laughs> you wish you were dead now, I bet. Yeah. All the, the poking with it. <laughs> um, and then the one after that is Time Quake, written in 19. 1997. So yeah. we've got a, a couple really interesting pieces coming up. It's going to be fun. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>